Good morning, I want to call the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission of March 5th, 2020, at being 9 a.m. Uh, the regular monthly meeting, uh, clerk, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Rotkin. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commission Alternate Lynn. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commission Alternate Reed. Here. Commissioner Friend. Here. Commissioner Coonerty. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Bertrand. Present. And Commissioner Lowe. Here. Hey, we do have a quorum. Um, we will now go to oral communication. Oh, now go to oral communications. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to address us on, on an issue that is not on the agenda uh, about an item? Uh, we have a three minute limit. Is there Yes, ma'am, come on up, come on up. Good morning. My name is Sandrine Georges. I'm, I've been living in this county for years, and I'm French. I'm from Europe. I love trains, and we love trains, and for, trains are great. Um, however, uh, as um, you can see uh, in the Bay Area, the smart train that is taken as an example for this corridor in our county is not working. In fact, Measure I, who was uh, raise, hoping to raise $2.4 billion over a 30 year span for the smart train has been defeated yesterday, um, sadly, because I love trains. It's not that I'm against a train in the county per se. I think a train is not suited on this specific corridor, um, and that's because over the years now there are too many residents really close to the corridor. And as you know, everybody wants a trail, but not everybody wants a train. And we can't have both most of the, along the, um, on, in the corridor. So I would like you to think about this. Um, active transportation is real. Every bike can be a passenger bike. We have electric cargo bikes that carry kids. One, two, three, four, we have electric solar enclosed vehicles or bikes that, uh, you know, carry one or two passengers. So, yeah, this is uh, something that is uh, just the best to me, and I'm not alone, as you know, uh, the best alternative for this county. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I just wanted to share an article with you. Uh, Love the bus and save your city was the title of this. It's from City Labs. You can uh, put that on Google and, and read the whole article. I kind of summarized it a little bit. Uh, basically, if your transportation options are limited, you need the bus maybe now more than ever. Uh, but even if you're not a regular passer, passenger, you need it too. Uh, it's not hard to see how trend deprioritization buses will hearken in the age of a demand of cars door to door. The problem with that is your streets can't handle all these cars taking people around in circles. The problem is your streets can't fit them. If you care about how well your city moves, how your local economy is faring, and how the planet's future fares, then you care about your city bus and you care about making the bus better. If you want to see your bus as a piece of social infrastructure that your whole city can take pride in, a sign of prestige, not decay. More than 17% of the country's bus systems have fallen out of good repair according to the uh, Federal Transportation Administration. Uh, in spread out, which is basically our county, unwalkable cities, you usually get there faster if you choose another more mode of transportation, and that's why our buses aren't used. Because it turns out that when rubber-tired fleets are treated as a mighty social good, people are willing to actually take the bus. Uh, to get to the traffic lights first, they get priority. Held to the standards of rail service, they get priority. They stop every half mile rather than every block. All this improves bus service. Uh, following the example of Houston, which overhauled uh, its entire bus route system, they increased 15% a capacity ridership in the first few years. Basically, a bus is quite the important thing. City Labs is now doing a study, 
an ongoing series that puts public coaches at the center of transportation future. Everybody talks about the bus dying. I think it's the reverse. Most of all, we plan to look at what's working on bus systems in the US. I think we should research that with the belief that there is no inherent reason that buses cannot be great. Which cities are winning the battles to prioritize road space? Where is the gold stan standard for frequent, fast, and reliable transit being set by buses? And how might that change local visions for future of transportation? The basic model, which we all know, a big moving container of people on a fixed route has never stopped working. It's time to make it work much, much better. Thank you. Good morning. Um, how are you, everyone? Uh, my name is Gina Cole, and I'm with Bike Santa Cruz County. I wanted to give a brief update um, of the fact that we've started uh, using, utilizing the funds that RTC granted us. Um, Watsonville's uh, open streets will be happening in June this year. Um, we're waiting on a super solid date from the city of Watsonville, but we're we're close. Um, and I hope that you will all come out and check that out. Uh, hoping to, to grow that particular event. Um, we had about 3,000 folks last year. We hope to grow that by at least another 1,000 this year. Um, we also have uh, youth programs going right now. Um, there is a earn a bike program in Live Oak, which is at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and we have two bike clubs also going, one at Branso 40 and one at Mission Hill. So, um, bike clubs take kids with bikes and teach them road skills um, as well as off-road skills and kind of trying to, to relay the message of how to be a safe cyclist, um, how to be predictable, how to use all the safety precautions um, when you're out and riding and how to navigate the city on a bike. Um, uh, let's see, Erna Bike will start in Watsonville today, um, and hopefully in the next two weeks we'll start our Erna Bike program at the Santa Cruz County, or Santa Cruz High School. Um, I also wanted to share um, information from our friends um, at Health Service Agency. Um, they are doing a, a walking program in Live Oak. Um, it starts in April, it's on Saturday mornings at 10, and it's about pedestrian safety. Um, so working with, with families to navigate safely around the county on, on your feet. So I'll leave those there. Um, additionally, um, we are just, we're really grateful for the funding to be able to rejuvenate those programs and we look forward to giving you all another update. Thank you. Thank you, you can give those to the clerk. That'd be great, that'd be great. Which one? Here, right thank here. you. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Greg Buzzard, 30-year resident of the county. Um, just a few comments on, on general RTC initiatives. I definitely support thoughtful long-range planning. I have my own ideas, but believe in, believe in the process and what's happening. Um, observation from the perspective of a long-term resident and, uh, and county voter. Uh, in 2012, we purchased the rail trail right-of-way Eight years later, not much has been done with it. I do understand that the beginnings of the trail are starting in the segments in Santa Cruz this year. I think that that's wonderful. I understand that there's plans over five years and the subsequent five years and et cetera to, to extend the trail. Let me just uh, implore the, uh, the uh, uh, commission to really consider taking the learnings from the first trail segment and applying it out equally across all the remaining segments uh, as soon as possible in the, in the ensuing few years. Uh, it's nice that we purchased the right of way in 2012, and I'm hoping that we can develop it into something that's usable by many of us in the community um, yeah, before I die, really. But uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Commissioners. David Date from La Salva Beach. Um, I really didn't have the luxury of coming today, and then I woke up to a text message saying that I had a letter in the Sentinel, um, so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, it is title they picked the transfer <laughs> the guys at the sentinel picked the mm -hmm. title of the article you don't actually get to choose your your editorial but he chose transportation revolution doesn't include a train time and again new technologies have proven to advance faster than governments can anticipate or plan for 
we are entering a new paradigm in transportation technologies that we should start talking about and preparing for today. There is considerable investment being poured into areas of ride hailing and autonomous driving technologies. In fact, many automakers are equipping their vehicles with the hardware necessary for future autonomous travel. Over the next couple years, we will begin to see the de a deployment of self-driving vehicles which will deliver you to and from your destination at a fraction of the cost. These technologies stand to resolve congestion, facilitate carpooling, and trans uh, transition us away from the use of fossil fuels. The efficiencies offered by such a system will make the idea of car ownership a novelty. This is a near-term 21st century transportation revolution that we should start preparing for today. So we do all these long-range, you know, short-range plans but when we actually look at where technology is today and we're on the cusp of this revolution in, in, in transportation, we need to start planning for that. And realistically, this you know, rapid transit you know, tr or train plan is not relevant in the five-year span of the development of these technologies. So if we could start planning for where you know, Tesla is going and Jaguar and Waymo and see what their vision is for the next five years, I think we can better plan transportation in this county. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. Um, Great elections, I was gonna talk about it, but I already sent you a note on it. I'm not gonna go into details on that. Um, but I will say that Trail Now is batting 100% on the elections. You know, we initially didn't support Measure D uh, a few years back, <clears throat> but um, I think Zach helped drive uh, the funding from the train to the trail, or actually to Metro, and we came out and supported it. And our organization, our supporters, actually provided the most funding to make it win. We also supported Measure L, and so we're batting pretty good, and we're feeling pretty good about that. Uh, Bruce, congratulations. Zach, congratulations. Zach, um, um, nothing more on that. Um, so most of you know that um, my day job is an engineer. Um, and so, you know, we go to the meetings, and I'm trying to get it so that I, we, we trying to open up the, the collaboration a little more to operate where you're like the workforce that we work with, engineers on the other side. So one of the things that um, we're trying to do is, you know, come across as a collaborative effort. And um, one of the things I want to focus on, though, is People need to show up to the meeting, and I don't want to be negative. And Andy, this is, uh, you know, I've been coming to involved in this organization for 20 years. I've actually been coming here for 10 years consistently. I actually showed up when Ryan's dad was on the board. But um, Ryan doesn't show up at these meetings. And so I'm asking if you go back to him and say, is this transportation not important? Because we would really like to have him continue to be involved in this. And I think that's the main message. We want him to come back, because that's basically, okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the audience who would like to address us? Okay, we will move on. Uh, are there any additions or uh, corrections, deletions to um, the consent agenda or regular agendas? Um, there is a um, replacement page for item seven, a handout for item 22, and a handout and replacement pages for item 23. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, moving to the consent agenda. Um, let's see, that'd be items uh, four through 19. Um, is there anybody that has any questions on the consent agenda? <laughs> Yes. Sorry, um, I did ask staff for a few questions on item seven. If they could just give me a little bit of a summary. We're putting together about three and a half million dollars on that project for a consent item, and I just wanted to highlight a few things that were in there. Uh, could I just ask staff to respond briefly on the questions I sent in earlier? Sure. Thank you. 
you, do, do you need me? I, I figure if I gave them to you, maybe you could just, in a nutshell. So the, the EIR that was previously approved is a programmatic level EIR um, for the full length of the corridor. Um, item seven is for a project specific um, EIR for just the State Park to Freedom project. Um, the, um, I'm trying to remember all your questions. I didn't print them out beforehand. I did I go over them with, with staff beforehand. Um, uh, the, uh, let me, let me, Guy. Sarah. Okay, Sarah. I've got the list in front of me, so I okay, can. Okay, that, that'll be easier out. than me trying to go thank off you, my memory. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so as Guy mentioned, <clears throat> the previous EIR was a programmatic EIR. Every project that moves forward um, needs to have a project level analysis. So that's what this project is gonna begin, is a project level analysis. Um, second question was, yeah, I mean, um, you, you don't necessarily need to go through every single one of them, but okay. even if you can sort of summarize um, what's what's happening here. Um, right. Those. Primarily, you know, we're spending three and a half million. We're we're voting on that on the consent agenda item. Uh, it's a 23 month project, essentially. Correct. And uh, the the follow up. I know that you're going to be doing some follow up in the communities, but I don't really know. Is it just Aptos because that's where it's located? You know, I know that you're going to get monthly updates on this one, but how will the public be involved in the process of communicating in the communities and which communities will be receiving those kinds of updates? Right, okay, so as part of the environmental analysis, uh, we'll have a scoping meeting that will take place in approximately four to five months, and that will most likely be uh, near the project site, so most likely Aptos, Rio Del Mar area. Um, and then there will be a, the environmental review uh, meeting, which will happen um, probably about 12 months out. Uh, and that will also be close to the project area. However, uh, staff <clears throat> performs outreach on all projects when we go to events in South County and North County. We bring uh, the project uh, fact sheet with us and we have a communications folks who um, are able to do outreach uh, for all projects mm -hmm. in whatever um, events that we go to. And so, um, we're not, we're not necessarily planning a, a meeting in Watsonville for this project. It wouldn't, um, typically, we try to keep the meetings close to the project site. So. Yeah, that's what I figured. Because okay. um, uh, obviously, w we, we, the need to know basis, because it's going to relieve Watsonville at some point when we get it going, but n the necessity of the EAR and you know, our comments for Watsonville on that. I, so I just wanted to have an idea on that. But um, I, think we're, I think we're good on the questions and okay. the answers you have here. And I, I know that I've had a response, so I can go back and read through them again. But you know, just for public purposes, $3.5 million on a consent, I just want to have a little bit of dialogue, just let public know how we're spending our money. Yes, uh, Mr. Fernandez. Chair, I, I have a question um, on item eight. Okay. on the uh, construction contract award for drainage culvert maintenance along the Santa Cruz branch line. Okay. Um, my, my, my question is, when, what's, the, what's gonna be the, con it's 200,000, does that trigger the prevailing wage requirement <coughs> for this project? Uh, this contract will be subject to prevailing wage, yes. Yeah, okay. and the threshold is much lower than that. It's, um, I think it's only like $1,000. So uh, most of all work that we do is subject to prevailing wage law. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was gonna be covered on that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from members of the commission? Um, Supervisor Friend? I don't have a question. I just need to recruit, recuse myself from item eight and nine. Um, for I have a personal financial interest as my house is within 500 feet of the rail line. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Uh, any, any questions from the public on the consent agenda items? Okay. Okay. Hi, Jessica Evans from the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. Good morning. Thank you for being here and for taking public comment. Um, so we just have a few um, comments um, for consent item six. We would like to thank you for extending the public comment deadline for the 2015 RTP project list so that we can take a little bit of time to look at that. Um, we appreciate staff's responsiveness in extending that, that deadline um, 
to enable public comment. For consent um, item seven, um, we, we did have some questions. Um, we just wanted to make sure that the um, TCAA results were going to be taken into consideration um, as part of that EIR, and it's clear that staff is totally on it and is going to be paying attention to that. So um, thank you for that. For consent item eight, uh, we want to thank you for doing the repair and maintenance along the transit corridor. Um, we're really pleased to see that going forward, um, and we're also happy to see on consent item nine um, the progress on the FEMA-funded storm damage repair projects from 2017. It's been a long time coming, and um, I know it's challenging to work with FEMA, and everyone has been giving you guys a hard time for it not happening sooner. And now it's happening, so um, we appreciate that. And that's all I have for the consent agenda. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael Saint, once again, uh, just quick comment on item 10 on the consent agenda. I think it's really good, good stuff that you're doing on that. I think money going in for the buses and the bus on shoulder issue and all this kind of stuff really helps. Adding 12 more trips, 15-minute uh, intervals from Watsonville on express service is super good. Um, the only thing CFST has a complaint about, which you've probably heard many times, um, is that you're combining these uh, advances in frequency and well as bus service um, and combining with cars in the same lane. Um, basically, our understanding through our research and studies, it's not going to reduce any time to destination if you throw the buses in with the cars. Thank you. Good morning, Mark Masidi Miller, longtime resident, professional engineer. Um, I don't think it was clear from uh, Jessica Evans' comments that item number seven on the consent, uh, it, it, what, there was a request to pull it. If, if she, that wasn't clear from her comments, I would like to make a request that you pull item seven. I'd like to make some comments about the scope of the EIR. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public who'd like to address this? Uh, is there anyone on the commission that wants to pull item number seven for discussion? We discussed that last month. Okay. Uh, come on, uh, Mr. Okay. Thank you uh, for inviting me back. Uh, my comments are generally focused on the scope of the IR with respect to the traffic analysis and the uh, environmental impact report. The, uh, there's some state legislation which now requires that VMT be a considered metric in an environmental analysis. And while VMT is, is mentioned in the analysis for um, the traffic study, the assessment of what the existing conditions are is not clearly identified as a VMT issue. And um, with respect to the uh, rail crossings, um, there's uh, a, a focus on the rail trail piece of it, but the combination of the public transit component of those rail bridges, whether that be bus or train as the commission decides sometime later this year, neither of those um, travel modes are cons being considered in part in the scope of the work. So and a, one a possible amendment would be uh, to include a specific language that says, you know, the based on the results of the uh, TCAA, the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis, that the scope of the IR be amended to reflect the decision to, uh, of the uh, commission and that that decision is reflected in the environmental analysis for that project. Um, so I think it has a germane effect on traffic and it should be considered and currently the scope of the work doesn't include that. So that's the scope, that's the juxta of my issues there. Questions? So I'll respond to the rail bridge issue. The rail bridges are being designed for um, existing rail loads. Um, that creates the largest environmental footprint for the project. Um, after the alternatives analysis, which is just a planning level document, it would be inappropriate to change um, 
the, um, the purpose of the bridge um, because we don't have environmental clearance and each project needs to have its own environmental clearance. It wouldn't be appropriate to include environmental clearance for um, uh, what comes out of the alternatives analysis as part of this EIR because each CEQA document needs to have um, independent utility and logical termini and that would not be the case uh, until that project um, was better defined and went through its own environmental analysis. Commissioner Rotkin, can you turn on your mic? So I was just, um, you heard my question. Yeah, so we, we determined and we'd had a significant discussions with our consultant team during interviews t as to how to address this issue. And we felt that the most prudent thing to do is this is an active railroad and we have current loads based on um, freight locomotives going over that, them, that we design these bridges to accommodate those loads. Um, if later um, during the design phase uh, we environmentally clear something lighter or we want to do something less, the footprint would be smaller than what we're currently designing because we're designing for a heavier foot load, so, uh, uh, freight load. So um, this provides us with the maximum amount of flexibility to then modify the design later to utilize the bridges for a different purpose if, if for some reason we d decide that the alternatives analysis comes up with a, a lighter train or a, a, a bus or um, some other purpose um, that didn't require such a big footprint. So this provides the maximum amount of flexibility. Caltrans was happy with this. They're the lead on this document. Um, so we believe this is the, the appropriate way moving forward. Um, we are looking at VMT. The guidelines on VMT are still being developed and we've also been told that if your project starts environmental uh, prior to June, that um, there's going to uh, not be the, the, what comes out of the guidelines as a requirement, but we're actually looking into it more so than, than actually required. So I believe that this, uh, the scope is appropriate for this document. Thank you. Thank you. May I respond? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Guy Preston, uh, for your uh, thoughtful consideration of the foundation requirements and environmental impact of the bridge structures themselves. But the issue, that's not the issue that I was specifically focused on, that is the traffic impact. Um, the type of transit that's ultimately selected will impact the type of uh, traffic loads uh, from a, use, from a uh, number of vehicles and vehicle miles traveled, and the Unified Corridor Study uh, demonstrated that, that uh, countywide transit use would go up significantly under a trail and rail scenario versus a trail and bus scenario by about two million users a year. And I would think that would have some impact on the traffic along Highway 1. And so that's the impact that I think uh, is not being considered that should be considered as part of the EIR. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, well, if it's different from what he just addressed. Uh, it is not. Okay. It's beyond the scope of this this document. I got this it. document is a highway and trail project, and the bridge is being replaced um, only because it needs to be replaced to widen the highway. So we're we're replacing the bridge in kind. Um, you're asking to increase the scope of this project to include the entire rail project, which would be inappropriate. From a traffic modeling perspective. You don't um, include projects that don't have environmental clearance as an existing condition. Um, and since this project's ahead of the transit project, uh, we're proceeding with um, not, not, in, not including the benefits of the transit as part of our modeling for the highway project, so. I'll be short, okay? I'll be short, very short. So just to level set us, you're essentially lowering the highway. You have to lower the highway to fit underneath the rails, underneath the rails. So we just, so the scope of work is extremely more. 65 million, I believe, is the additional cost just because you have to lower the highway. So this is an example of defining your requirements up front, which unfortunately, it is what it is, and they're doing what they can. You have a rail. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, Mr. go ahead, Mr. I was just going to move oh, the consent oh, agenda. Mr. Schiffer. I just wanted to uh, 
Oh, no, it's a light, light. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, EIR comment because I think that uh, it, it's worth taking into consideration by staff uh, whether it can be done within the scope or not. In the end, CEQA requires that potential impacts be looked at and analyzed. Um, whether that project that would create those impacts has been approved yet, if it's in the queue, um, I think there could be a case that those are impacts that should be looked at under CEQA. So I'm not sure I understood all the details of what was being talked about, but it seemed like it's worth considering the um, suggestion of a potential impact on what, uh, what would happen in the future, even though that project hasn't been approved or isn't through the process. Under CEQA, that might not be determinative. So I just ask that you look into it. Yeah, I, what I'm hearing is this really not necessary or required at this time, so I... It will be in the cumulative impact analysis, but it will not be in the traffic modeling. Okay, well, I mean, as I just think it needs to be incorporated. That seems... And it will in the cumulative impact analysis. ...would be analysis. sufficient. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we are going to get to this question when we're doing a comparative study, and that's the issue that's here, which is, you know, what, what are the vehicle miles travel different between train, bus, and so forth, and that doesn't have to be done on this project uh, because we're going to end up with a project that's large enough to accommodate which, whatever uh, choice we make. So I'm going to move the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded um, to approve the uh, consent agenda as as, uh, um, as uh, presented. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's ordered unanimously. We will now go to the regular agenda, number item number 20, for commissioner reports, uh, oral reports. Uh, any commissioner have a statement on any item that's in general? Okay, we'll move on to number item number 21, the appointment of commissioners to the Budget and Administrative Personnel Committee. Uh, this is um, one addition. I think Mr. Jacques Brutin from the five uh, county supervisor appointments is on that. Is that correct? That is the current makeup of the, the um, BNA committee, yes. Okay, so that's what the proposal is. Uh, is there any public comment on that? Seeing none. Second. Second. Moved and seconded to approve um, item number 21. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Item number 22 is the uh, director's oral report. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, I am pleased to announce that the RTC has hired Krista Corwin to fill RTC's vacant administrative uh, assistant position. Krista earned her bachelor's degree in history at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, then served two years in the AmeriCorps here in the Silicon Valley. She interned at the ACLU of Northern California before attending graduate school, earning a master's degree in sociology from UC Davis. Krista recently retired from a nine-year career in roller derby and represented Santa Cruz internationally with the local all-star team, the Boardwalk Bombshells. Krista is passionate about wellness and active transportation and expects to compete the, in the AIDS life cycle biking 545 miles from San Francisco to Los Angeles in June this year. Krista brings grant writing experience and organizational skills to the RTC and is excited to put her passion for public service to work in the expanding world of regional transit. Krista is here today sitting in the front row. Um, she will be um, active at our board meeting, so you'll get to know Krista very well. Welcome. Nice to have you here, and uh, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> On February 19th, uh, Chair McPherson, Vice Chair Gonzalez, uh, and I um, joined representatives of the Central Coast Coalition in Sacramento for Legislative Day. The coalition consists of the Regional Transportation Planning Agencies for the counties of Santa Cruz, San Benito, Monterey, San Luis Obispo, and Santa Barbara, as well as the Association of Bay Area Governments. By working together, we have found that our agencies can be more effective at ensuring common goals are met for the Central Coast. The coalition met with representatives of the State Transportation Agency, Caltrans, the California Transportation Commission, the California High Speed Rail Authority, and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Although the discussion was focused on the coalition's Senate Bill 1 project nominations for the next cycle of grant opportunities, also subjects were, were, other subjects were also addressed. 
Chair McPherson and Vice Chair Gonzalez and I highlighted the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus and Shoulder Project as a multimodal solution that is expected to reduce congestion while providing significant benefits for bicycles, bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit users. RTC's project garnered considerable interest as being innovative and consistent with statewide goals for multimodal uh, sustainable solutions to transportation challenges. RTC staff is working on applications for the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus on Shoulder projects for Soquel Drive to State Park Drive for the next cycles of Solution to Congested Corridor program and the local partnership program. Applications for competitive um, SCCP and LPP are due in June 2020 with CTC action expected in December of 2020. And I really appreciate um, both Vice Chair Gonzalez and Chair McPherson's um, uh, attendance. They were very active in, in the discussions. In fact, uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez highlighted the City of Watsonville's Harkin SLU project, which is needed to improve pedestrian access to Pajaro Valley High School. This project is a strong candidate for the next cycle of the active transportation program. The 2021 ATP um, guidelines are under development and the Harkins Loop project is expected to compete well. It just missed being funded in the cycle four in 2019 and we expect to work closely with the city of Watsonville to make sure that it gets funded this time. Uh, Chair McPherson also discussed the good work of the Monterey Bay Community Power bringing carbon-free energy to the region. Chair McPherson discussed how um, Monterey Bay um, Community Power partnered with the California Energy Commission and the Center for Sustainable Energy to offer $7 million in incentives for EV chargers through the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Central Coast Initiative Project, businesses, multi-unit dwellings, nonprofits, and local government properties can qualify for rebates to purchase and install eligible EV chargers in Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties. Uh, Caltrans District Director uh, Tim Gummins uh, reminded the coalition that Caltrans recently installed the state's first 100% solar-powered electric vehicle charging station at Camp Roberts rest areas along Highway 101 in San Luis Obispo County. Two direct current fast charging stations are connected to pivoting solar panels and battery systems. Both Chair McPherson and Chair Gonzalez also, Vice Chair Gonzalez also discussed the challenges of the state highways serving as main streets in many communities throughout Santa Cruz County. State officials emphasized a commitment to shift the focus away from traditional solutions that focused only on the automobile. STA Secretary David Kim discussed potential legislation to change the way speed limits are determined, known as prima facie speed limits. This topic has considerable interest for coalition members, including RTC, and we will continue to monitor, support, and provide updates on legislation to allow for changes in how speed limits are set. That concludes my report. That's great. Thank you. Um, any questions? Uh, what I would uh, just want to say one thing. It was a very, I think, productive meeting, and we addressed, although it's the Highway 1 corridor of these five counties that is the main topic of conversation, it's very important that we be engaged in this. Um, also, I wanted to mention that Monterey Bay Community Power, from a meeting of yesterday, is going to soon be Central Coast Community Energy because uh, the, uh, there's agencies in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties that are going to make up this 32 agency um, uh, um, agency now. So it's, uh, it's great to have expanded uh, along, and it matches the five counties that we have here that we're, we're discussing. Um, I also discussed um, with the same five counties, housing and transportation issues in a meeting and pass rolls uh, with a new agency. So the central coast uh, counties of Santa Barbara uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito are in a lot of uh, these organizations together. And so it's going to be really important that we address these on a cooperative manner and an understandable manner. And I think that's what's taking place. So I'm, I'm very encouraged about this and I think we can bring a lot more uh, interest and power to our, our region uh, when we're in this together. So yep. I, I want to I appreciate uh, everything that everybody has done to get us to this point. With climate change, they might be part of Monterey Bay in the long run. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? 
Thank you. Um, all right, we will move to the Caltrans report, um, the Santa Cruz County project updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to start again by restating what our, uh, our, our new director, Toksami Shakan, has set forward as his uh, five priorities for the department. Number one is safety. Every day, 10 people die on California's transportation system. Two of those are pedestrians or bicyclists. Uh, he is not content with that. He's working towards zero deaths, and he's asking us to do what we can to uh, ensure that the highway is as safe as it can be. He has hired a chief safety officer as part of his uh, campaign to um, elevate the importance of safety. As you know, safety has always been number one with Caltrans. He's interested in bringing it even higher and giving it more attention. Uh, second priority is modality. He's interested in leveraging uh, managed lanes, transit, active transportation, and freight projects, and making things uh, integrate in a better way. He's, he's especially interested in this, knowing that our um, population in California is expected to increase by 25% uh, over the next 30 years, and that freight movement will increase by about 75%. Innovation is the third point in this list. Uh, he's considering business as usual is not an option, uh, wants to embrace a mindset of change and transformation, uh, getting the state ready to deal and address with things like climate change, affordable housing, and the homelessness crisis. Fourth point is efficiency. Uh, SB1 itself, which is state law, requires that Caltrans <coughs> find and uh, achieve $100 million in savings annually. Uh, in the first year, we identified $133 million. In the second year, $233 million. And it's not just about SB1. It's just about uh, stewardship for the um, public taxpayer dollars and being able to uh, do more and uh, shift our priorities into what makes the most sense with the taxpayer dollars. Uh, the fifth priority is partnerships, knowing that uh, in it, really to do California's business that Caltrans obviously cannot work in isolation, but that through our partnerships we leverage uh, the resources, the talent, and the energy of all of us together to achieve more. And so he's expecting us to, to work um, more in concert with our stakeholders and really leverage, uh, leverage those relationships to achieve more. Any questions? Uh, Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm Are not you, done. You're not done? Okay, let me see. <laughs> I'll, I'll get through the other ones One more question. More no, All right. Um, I wanted to announce that Caltrans has released the VMT-focused transportation impact study guide. On your last item, there was a discussion about the vehicle miles traveled uh, um, shift from low level of service. Um, the, this study guide, being VMT-focused, is what Caltrans will use to evaluate land use projects. There's a subsequent analysis, a technical guide that will come out for how we evaluate transportation projects themselves, but this one is for land use. Feedback is, is um, requested by March 30th. If you or your uh, public works planning agencies haven't seen this, we, we can forward it out to you. I think there was a quite wide distribution, but I'd be happy to um, follow up with a subsequent distribution, and uh, sometimes it's better to be redundant. And then um, finally, just a few follow-up items. Uh, the 5310 program you had um, asked about information for uh, zero emission vehicle purchases, and we have a, there's a letter uh, on the dais for you uh, responding to that. That both the Altoona testing and the Buy America requirements are necessary f um, to use federal funding, and there's no ZEV option for this the the style of bus um, for the 5310 program that meets both those requirements right now. So it's a limitation um, based on the federal funding at this time. Highway 1, the construction going on Highway 1 includes, importantly, uh, work on six overcrossings for pedestrian activity. And I, I wanted to note that we're upgrading 46 curb ramps and installing 32 accessible pedestrian uh, signals. Those are <clears throat> audible signals. And we are making progress. You'll see things kind of start and stop. Uh, but there, we're, we're, making, we're making progress along the way. You'll, you'll start to see changes with uh, some cones being put up and, and coming down and um, slow progress, but it'll all be done by, the, by December. 
And then there's a, a, a second project. The project that's under construction now at the, at the fish hook, there will be a, a, um, a subsequent project that goes uh, up Highway 17, another three-tenths of a mile we call Posse Tampo 2. It's listed in your report here as project number three. We expect that project to go into construction uh, um, later this spring. Now, question. Okay, and that's <laughs> it, huh? That's it. Yes, Mr. Bertrand. So um, you mentioned uh, highways, city, uh, excuse me, going through uh, cities, you know, Caltrans. And um, I read an article um, that talked about the uptick in pedestrian fatalities. And so being that uh, Caltrans goes through the cities, Watsonville is a good example. Um, what is uh, Caltrans doing to try to work on safety issues related to this particular problem that's had an uptick recently? Commissioner Bertrand, we have a um, we have a number of, of initiatives to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety. There is a um, a monitoring program that we have that's very active. We also have several projects, um, as I mentioned, some of the um, uh, signal modifications that we're doing. Uh, but also, the director has asked his chief safety officer to try to get a, a better handle on the contributing factors uh, and the uptick of the pedestrian. Uh, type collisions. I, I don't have the data available to me right now, but I certainly um, think we can bring something back. And because I think it's important to understand what some of the underlying trends are that are associated with that, so we can a attack it from that standpoint. Yeah, I'd appreciate feedback on that. Uh, distracted uh, driving comes up as you know everyone points to that. The other one is I've received a lot of questions about the curb improvements. It seems like going to December to finish them all is extensive amount of time. Um, it definitely decreases pedestrian activity. Uh, certainly in Santa Cruz and Capitola, I noticed that. Uh, you can't even walk on the sidewalks to cross a, a road like at the Bay Porter exit entrance. So it seems like we're sort of defeating ourselves because the project's moving so slowly. I can check into the staging. It's the, the contract is tied when, in with all of the work on Highway 1. So it's a multiple faceted um, project with the uh, pavement, the bridge rails, and the overcrossings. So I can, I can uh, see if we can evaluate the timing. Uh, but the, the whole contract is bundled. And so the contractor has all this time until December to finish everything. I think, for example, at State Park, they're estimating that I, might be done there within a month or so. Uh, I can see if I can get a, a little better handle on each of the other overcrossings in terms of the timing, if it's available. Yeah. So my point is it's defeating the, the purpose of these, which is to increase or promote pedestrian activity. Any other questions? Yes, so Mr. Hernandez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question on item 18 um, for the crosswalks on pedestrian safety enhancements. Um, in some conversations with our, my fellow city councilmen on this matter of the, the FPSs being installed? Yes. Fashion Beacon services? Uh, you said number 18? Yeah, number 18. Yes. Um, is, there, is there any, um, I guess the question to ask is, that, is there any possibilities that would, instead of being a yellow flashing beacon light, that it can be converted into a red flashing beacon light? Because it just sends, seems that we have yellow flashing beacon lights on, on Main Street and our highway, um, and it just seems that the traffic, instead of uh, coming to a, stall, a stop, they see it flashing and they tend to speed up because they, they, they want to beat that person crossing that crosswalk. Uh, it, it's just a horrible thing, you know. Uh, that it, for them, it's just kind of like that, that syndrome of the, you know, it's turning yellow, so I better hurry up through the intersection. Is there any way that instead of them being yellow flashing big lights that, that we can convert them to red so they indicate them to, to come to a complete stop? Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, you're speaking to traffic control devices which are highly regulated and there's a lot of thought and engineering that goes into every detail of those devices and I'm certain that the yellow is, um, is a requirement for that device. I can... Um, I think that the, if they are looking at um, other options to change the color, it would be a statewide option. I can I can float the idea and see if they're looking at that. I mean, this might go to Commissioner Bertrand's point: is what's behind all these fatalities? Are people not, oh, you know, if they're 
if there's a, and let me say this too, the um, manual and uniform traffic control devices is the Bible for traffic engineers for what gets put in on the roads, uh, and for good reason. Um, when you have a proliferation of signs and types of devices, people tend not to see them the same. So that might be why some of your constituents have asked for a sign for every, you know, lots of people like to request signs, but we don't just put them up everywhere because we don't want to um, dull the senses uh, for the driver. Um, but in this era of promoting pedestrian safety, there may be other um, things that we need to do. And the, the rectangular flashing beacons is one of the relatively newer items on the, um, that's being used, and it's being used um, uh, quite a lot. Uh, there might be a time period where they're evaluating their proficiency and being able to say how successful they are. I think with any new device, it's also imperative that there's a public awareness campaign, education for people, for drivers to know how to behave in those circumstances. I just wanted to follow up on the um, pedestrian improvements that are going on right now. Um, I noticed in a couple uh, significant locations during the process, I know that with the winter weather, the construction of those pedestrian improvements is stalled. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of locations, Porter Street being one, um, 41st Avenue being another, where the temporary asphalt work, um, in my opinion, was creating some hazards. And so just to follow up on the point that, that the construction takes time, we understand that, but interim conditions um, of construction projects related to pedestrian or bike improvements should still maintain a certain level of safety. And I think we did a great job with that with respect to the, the state park configuration and all the bollards and everything to make that, that passage safe. But those two other locations, the temporary asphalt had big cracks and big gaps and could e easily be a hazard. So, as we continue to move forward with that, um, I may follow up with you afterwards just to see what the status is on, on making those things a little bit safer as the construction continues. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. Any other questions from questions from the public? This is just a report. So, Jessica Evans again. I just I do have one question um, in terms of just speaking to. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez question I understand that you have very specific requirements for um, you know which uh, how a, a given device is used um, I, I just um, wonder if sometimes um, you know a different device is appropriate I mean and, and I don't know um, when you might embed flashing lights in the pavement instead of only putting up a a high um, sign that drivers often just go right through. I mean, we see this in Mission Street in Santa Cruz as well. There's been a number of near misses and uh, a lot of people are not able to use those crossings where those devices are installed because they're not effective. So I don't know, I, I, I think I just wanna maybe. say like, maybe that's not the right device. It's not <laughs> Morning, Commissioners. Manu Koenig, a candidate for First District Supervisor. Um, I wanted to call attention in the Caltrans report to uh, the call for managed lanes. This is actually something that I ended up speaking about uh, on the campaign trail about quite a bit because people desperately want a solution for the highway and we need a funding source. So as I explained it, we're leaving the money to fix the highway out there on the road every day, probably about $260 million in lost time. And so if you provide, uh, if you build a fast track lane or a managed lane as uh, is being called for here by, by Caltrans, you essentially give someone the opportunity to pay $3 to get out of traffic instead of spending $6 of their time stuck in traffic. So this is really the best long-term solution for the highway. You know, there's plenty of cars out there. We don't need to be providing more uh, government-owned vehicles. What we do need to do is make sure that we manage the space on the road effectively. Here's another simple way to think about it. If you had a grocery store where all the food was free, the shelves would be empty and there'd be a line around the block. That's exactly what we have on the highway now. You've got to charge for the food and that way you can dependably sell food dependably offer space on the highway. So I highly recommend that this commission ask for uh, a report on how some of the managed lanes are doing in the Bay Area. We've put in quite a few over there. And I think it'd be really um, a good step forward to understand how those lanes are working and what it would take to implement one here. Thank you. 
Hello again. Um, traffic safety is very important to me, as everybody, but um, we have lost a dear friend, a dear friend a few years ago at the fish hook. She died, she was 12. She was at the back of her mother's car and a box truck um, collided um, into them. Um, I'm also a cyclist. I've been commuting for eight years. Um, and uh, being from Europe, I, ju I just want to highlight something. Could you just stick with the, the report and what's on here, please? Uh, right. I thought it was um, some um, related because, um, as you were saying, um, overwhelming, if you will, uh, motorists with all kinds of signs and everything. I, I was trying to get into this. Um, maybe I can try, but you. Um, right. um, basically, in um, as long as you give motorists the priority, this is going to be a problem. As you were addressing, people tend to speed up when they can or um, if they want. In Europe, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, where a lot of Let's just stick with the subject Sorry. matter, please. Here, you know, sure. the, the projects. Okay. Um, I guess I won't go into that. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Helmer, Ben Loman, pertaining to two comments on that report. Uh, in the state of Florida, uh, they are investigating. Um, the use of rapid uh, rectangular flashing beacons. Uh, they're looking at using the red color in mid-block locations, not at intersections. It's not a done deal. It's under investigation. Caltrans may want to follow up with FDOT. Um, and also to the um, executive director's report and the comment about what is Caltrans doing, I think the um, AB 2363 um, conclusion with the Caltrans and Cal STA's report on looking at allowing Caltrans to utilize prima facie 25 mile per hour speed limits on state highways is one of the biggest and best recommendations that came out of that report. Guy and I have talked about this a lot. I've approached you for over a year or two about prima facie 25 on main streets, on narrow highways in rural communities like Ben Loman, Las Gatas, Watsonville, and others. So um, the um, committee on the task force has now formed a subcommittee, and they're looking, they are starting to write a proposed language for legislative change to utilize prima facie 25 on um, business activity centers on uh, rural communities. So I really encourage you to get behind and support that effort. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Rotkin. I, I want to reinforce uh, what uh, Mr. Helmer just said about the 25 mile an hour issue. That's really a key issue on these many of these situations. Also, it's not a state highway, but just to get a sense of what another option might be, if you look at West Cliff Drive in front of the Dream Inn, they've, it's a crosswalk in the middle of a block and they've got a bunch of uh, flags and so forth, and it's, it's not a flashing signal or anything like that. It just wakes people up, and it's made a huge difference in terms of the cars stopping for pedestrians there, which they never used to do. They used to drive by when people are obviously ready to cross the, uh, the street. So that might have some application. I don't know, but it's worth at least someone taking a look at it. Okay. Any other? Uh, used to be. Um, okay. You have a comment. Uh, please be brief, and uh, this is uh, just directed to the report itself. Right, exactly. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, our Caltrans representative following up on the 5310 grant program. Um, I've actually talked with the Lightning Systems and asked if Caltrans had called them to inquire whether there was that type of vehicle, and they have had no contact with Caltrans uh, at all. So I've kind of turned it over to uh, Community Bridges. I sent them all the uh, emails and that type of stuff, and they're now looking over the th process of possibly looking into it themselves, um, and one that you might consider is a Chrysler Pacifica Hybrid. It's a uh, kind of an ambulatory um, uh, tra uh, transit van, minivan is what they were looking for. So um, that might be something you want to look into, and um, I think they'll be maybe following up with you on this also. But thank you for all your, your troubles. Appreciate it. Any other questions from the commissioners? We will move on to item number 24.
uh, the camping enforcement challenges. It's an oral report uh, from the Highway Patrol, Lieutenant Ian Troxell and Officer Steve Busseth are here to address us and thank you very much. I know I had talked to the commander uh, and for to try to get a report on this and I appreciate your being here today. Well, good morning and thank you, Lieutenant Ian Troxell with uh, the California Highway Patrol. Uh, yeah, the uh, homeless issue is a, a significant problem within the county and we're doing the very best we can um, to keep the homeless safe in regards to uh, pedestrian safety, crossing the highways and whatnot. Uh, the California Highway Patrol in partnership with the California Department of Transportation is working hard to make our freeways as safe as possible. Throughout the state, there are certain areas where homeless encampments are set up near our freeways. In these areas, homeless people oftentimes use freeway shoulders and freeway lanes to gain access to the encampments. Being a pedestrian on the freeway is extremely dangerous and illegal. Numerous people have been injured or killed because of secondary collisions that occur as well as the collisions that happen as motorists react to avoid striking a pedestrian. Sadly, many of the pedestrians killed on freeways are homeless people. The CHP and Caltrans will continue to address these safety concerns to ensure our, free, our, our freeways are safe. Now let's talk a little bit about um, Santa Cruz County itself, right? Um, there's some significant challenges when you're dealing with the homeless populations in the encampments. I kind of break them up to three different types of populations within these camps. One are truly homeless. They're working within the communities. They cannot afford to live in a house, and so they are homeless. Uh, two, you have a significant mental health uh, population within the encampments. And then three, you have a criminal population in there that utilizes the camps to deal drugs, um, prostitution, and different things like that. So those are some significant issues we're dealing with. Uh, in addition to um, those issues, uh, there is the law of the land, Brown versus Ohio, which um, kind of hampers our ability to immediately remove homeless. You have to, one, give them a proper notice, which is typically about 72 hours. Caltrans does a fantastic job of doing that. You, call, can also, you can't also separate them uh, from their property. Uh, so that's also a challenge. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, issues that I've come across with when dealing with the encampments is um, we'll give someone who is homeless uh, a notice and they're like, hey, we just went to, down to the shelter and there isn't any room or beds available for us to go. So that's a significant issue. Um, so there's the enforcement piece. Our main mission is to provide safety for Caltrans after they've done all the required um, announcements. Uh, two is that the education piece, our public information officers have been down in the camps and tried to educate the homeless uh, on traffic safety, pedestrian safety, um, not utilizing the freeways to make their way to and from uh, certain uh, areas in the county, um, specifically the methadone clinic. Is they typically use the freeway to walk over and go to the methadone clinics. Uh, that tends to be an issue. Uh, and engineering, uh, that's the last piece. We'll continue to engage with Caltrans on some of our ideas uh, to try and make it a little bit safer. Uh, in these areas um, and maybe create spaces that um, aren't so comfortable to pop up a tent, uh, those different types of things. So um, I will open it up to questions in regards to any of that, if you have any. Thank you for being here again. I know this is a, a, a problem not only in Santa Cruz County, but throughout the state. And um, are, is the uh, CHP, um, addressing this or the state uh, on a, shall we say, a collective address on the, on the issue to try to say this is what we should, I mean, does one size fit all on some of your recommended uh, actions to correct this situation? Unfortunately, one size does not fit all because of uh, the different counties um, and what the political climate is within those counties. If you have particularly the laws that are, um, <laughs> or policies and procedures established by a certain sheriff that says you can't do X, Y, and Z, or we won't, um, if you were to get to the point of an, of an arrest of uh, failing to obey laws as, a, as the homeless, if the county jail isn't gonna take those homeless folks, then there's issues there. So different counties have different policies and procedures to help that out. Um, as far as the education campaign, that's the same statewide. 
Uh, we're aggressively trying to educate the homeless in the dangers of living so close to um, our freeways. Is, um, have you addressed, uh, or would it be beneficial to address our sheriff or just to see how you can cooperate your, coordinate your? Yes, we, we, uh, we are continually, we continually meet on a monthly basis with the sheriff. Um, there has been some positive steps. Uh, there are mobile mental health teams that are going out to address some of these issues. Um, and there has been some success reported from that. So I don't know where the funding sources come from that, but I would encourage that if you have oversight over that, to, that those programs are working um, and to, con to continue to look at that. Uh, additional space uh, for the homeless. I mean, that's what it comes down to. They need somewhere else to go. They need a roof over their heads, somewhere safe, somewhere they can go. Um, and that's just not there. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. You just mentioned that mobile mental health um, team. Is that affiliated with our county service providers or is that something independent from the? That's affiliated with the uh, county service providers. Great, yep. thank you. Yep. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So if you had um, your druthers and wanted to lobby the legislature, what kind of changes would you ask from the state representatives to kind of help your situation and uh, maybe alleviate this uh, conundrum? I think affordable housing, one, not my lane, but uh, that would be so one. Speak. Um, yeah, yeah, you need more beds for, these, for people that just cannot afford to live outside of a tent. Um, I would look at uh, grants for traffic safety, pedestrian safety, that's, that's still an issue. We just recently had a, a fatal traffic collision involving a homeless pedestrian um, on Highway 1. That continues to be an, an, an issue. So if we can look at maybe some engineering aspects um, of the roadways uh, that we can collaborate with Caltrans on, those might be some uh, positive steps uh, in some areas. I've uh, made a recommendation. Uh, Pretty simple recommendation is putting boulders in these big open spaces areas when they're not in use. So it you know, may not make it so easy to, to have an encampment. Do you, do you get uh, complaints from neighbors and so forth who call you and say, uh, we have a problem here? Absolutely. Uh, that, that continues at least on a weekly basis. Um, my most recent complaint wasn't really highway related. It was more, hey, they're starting to camp out by the cemetery and I didn't want to go and visit you know, my deceased husband, but yet there's homeless people living in the cemetery. So there are a lot of, a lot of issues. Any other questions? Thank you for your concern. Thank you for your um, efforts and uh, your coordinated efforts. And you're right, it's, um, it's a very complicated issue, uh, the housing issue, which is a whole other subject, but it, it, that's what it's all about, to try to do what we, we have different health and human service organizations that are trying to do this in a cooperative manner with the city and the county as well. Uh, whenever I go to CSAC, the County State Association of Counties, uh, what's the biggest problem you have? Well, it's housing homeless combined. And so um, we're not alone here in Santa Cruz County, but uh, I thank you for your efforts in working with our sheriff and, uh, and really with the county and it's working with the cities to try to address this problem. In, uh, in a more direct and efficient manner as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Lieutenant. Day. Thank you. Okay, we will go to item number 25, uh, the transit corridor alternatives, alternatives analysis, goal screening criteria performance measures, and initial list of alternatives. Ginger Dykar will Derek. start uh, this discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Ginger Dykar, Senior Transportation Planner on RTC staff, and I'm the Project Manager for the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis. The Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis is evaluating transit investment options that utilize the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line as a dedicated transit facility. RTC and Metro staff have been working together with HDR engineering consultants on this analysis. 
Uh, I'll start off the presentation today to providing an overview of the project, including the performance-based planning process we are following and the stakeholder outreach to date. And then I'll hand it off to uh, Pam Yonkin, Yonkin and Steve Decker from HDR Engineering, who will talk about the evaluation framework composed of the goals, screening criteria, and performance measures, and then the initial list of alternatives. The alternatives analysis is evaluating transit investment options on the rail corridor that could run from Schaefer Road on the west side of Santa Cruz to through Watsonville to Pajaro Station. The analysis will develop an integrated transit network for Santa Cruz County utilizing all a part of the Santa Cruz branch rail line as a dedicated transit facility. The outcome of this analysis is to identify a locally preferred alternative for transit on the rail corridor. This analysis follows a performance-based planning process where an initial list of alternatives is compiled. These alternatives are then screened down qualitatively using a screening criteria to reduce down to a short list of alternatives. Then the short list of alternatives will be evaluated quantitatively using performance measures to determine a locally preferred alternative. There are three key milestones of the project. The project team is here today to solicit input and seek approval from the commission on milestone one, which is the evaluation framework that's composed of the goals, screening criteria, and performance measures, and also the initial list of alternatives. And once the evaluation framework and initial list of alternatives is approved, the project team will be screening the alternatives qualitatively. The next milestone, or milestone two, will be to determine the short list of alternatives that make it through the screening process. And the final or third milestone is to present the performance analysis results and determine the locally preferred alternative. The stakeholder engagement for milestone one was extensive in both English and Spanish through email blasts, social media, print and radio ads, event tabling, media coverage, partner agency and RTC advisory committee meetings. There were uh, two open houses, uh, one in Watsonville and one in Live Oak. Uh, focus group meetings, three sets of focus group meetings with local community organizations and an online survey, as well as project information on the uh, Santa Cruz County Transportation Commission website. At the open houses, there was uh, record attendance. There was approximately 250 people in the Live Oak open house and approximately 50 people in Watsonville. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand off the presentation to Pam Yomkin from uh, HDR Engineering. Let me make sure I can switch it. Huh? Maybe not. Ginger, how do we move it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. No. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, my name is Pam Yonkin. I work for HDR Engineering, here to talk a little bit about the evaluation framework that we intend to use for this process. Um, it is a triple bottom line framework that's based on economy, environment, and uh, and uh, the uh, social equity, which is also consistent with the Unified Corridor Investment Study, the 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan, and also state and federal guidance related to these sorts of prioritization activities. The um, we have uh, uh, presented three different matrices, actually four, that include those triple bottom line measures of equity, economy, and social equity, and then a fourth that uh, discusses other considerations that we'll be making when we look through these project alternatives. Um, if you take a look at the uh, matrix, they're all very consistent. We present the goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, in the description column, we describe the question we're trying to answer, and in the evaluation metric column, we point out the performance measure or the data point or information that we'll be using in order to inform our evaluation. We have, after considerable public uh, input and also input from the ad hoc committee, decided to use an ABC 
evaluation format where A is most desirable, B is moderately desirable, and C is least desirable. And th that will be used for all of the different evaluation criteria for the phase one screening. And the phase one screening will be focused on information and data that we have available. It'll be a little bit more high level than when we dig into the actual uh, value engineering and more um, detailed prioritization, which will be phase two of the evaluation. Just to give you a little bit of an example, um, with the supports economy, we uh, took public input and we changed some of the measures so that they were a little bit more focused. And we also uh, added some additional detail throughout all of the different measures in order to inform the evaluation. Yeah, still trying to get it. So the first three are very similar. They have a similar format. The last one, focuses on other goals, and the other goals have to do with things like technical feasibility, uh, are they consistent with other planning efforts, are they consistent with regulatory requirements, et cetera. And then at the end, um, we will come up with the initial screening, present that to uh, folks and the commission, and get additional public input to move to the next phase. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Steve Decker, who'll talk a little bit about some of the alternatives. See if I could get this right. Um, so as, as we started this process, in parallel with the evaluation approach that Pam just went through, we identified an initial list of the universe of alternatives that we would look at and assess starting with screening in this uh, uh, alternatives analysis. As part of that process, we went through multiple meetings and then went to the public, partner agencies, um, uh, focus groups to really refine that list as we did with the uh, analysis approach that Pam just spoke to. So we, we're going to go through briefly the alternatives that we honed in on and that we are proposing to evaluate as part of this process. Uh, there are core services on the right of way uh, that we are going to focus on in screening and then connector services that will also, uh, you know, different types of transit service that will connect to this core service that we'll also evaluate. Oops, I knew I would do that. I got it. I think I have it. For some reason, the title doesn't show up. I'm, I'm going backwards. <laughs> there it is. So we started our universe of alternatives looking at different types of rubber wheel bus types of services. We understand and we have documented things like, you know, these could be autonomous, they could be uh, you know, driven by human driven. Uh, there are different service models, local, uh, commuter, uh, different types of the inner city, different types of propulsion, electric, diesel, um, different uh, uh, carrying capacity of the different types of services, anywhere from four, moving four people to maybe 100 people per car um, or per vehicle. So we looked at those kinds of things and we'll build those into our evaluation of the alternatives analysis when we go through screening. And then here just are some examples of uh, the bus uh, types of services, rubber wheel. These include, you know, regular bus that Metro uh, currently operates. And these will be really targeted for the right of way. Uh, bus rapid transit, commuter bus, express bus, a variety of uh, uh, bus op op uh, options. There's some unique options here too that we felt we needed to look at too to really complete the universe. Autonomous road trains, which are shown there. Uh, in the middle, sort of a, a, a fancy looking uh, bus that uh, almost looks like light rail, but it's a bus. Uh, we looked at dual rail and bus uh, vehicle types of alternatives, as well as micro shuttles, uh, which would be autonomous vehicle types of shuttles. <clears throat> we also looked at uh, rail alternatives, different types of rail alternatives, uh, inner city rail, commuter rail, very traditional, uh, diesel units, light rail. A monorail as well as trams and trolleys. So we looked at very traditional types of uh, uh, alternatives there as well. And then we got into some of the non-traditional uh, types of strategies, including things like personal rapid transit, uh, inverted purple, uh, personal rapid transit, gondolas, string rail, hyperloops, those kinds of things that we'll evaluate as well as part of this universe. <clears throat> In addition, as we screen through the process, 
there will be some connector services that we'll evaluate too when we get into the detailed analysis. So for example, personal rapid transit may be, or BRT or bus could be used and identified to connect to the right of way service. So we wanna, we, we will evaluate those too when we get to the detailed analysis. And here are some examples of what those types of strategies will, will, will look like. They're very similar to what we already showed for the connector or the core services. They just will be used to connect. And one of the main goals here obviously is to not only connect with Metro bus, whatever this uh, service would be, but also uh, uh, outside external uh, rail and other opportunities uh, outside of uh, Santa Cruz. So that's the universe of alternatives. We talked a little bit about the uh, evaluation approach in this schedule for next steps. We are right in the middle there of uh, you know, completing uh, milestone number one mid-March and we'll have about a two month period to screen and define those screen projects that move forward into detailed evaluations. That's what we're working on right now. Milestone number two, probably completed by, uh, you know, sometime in uh, April, May through a variety of uh, planning processes and outreach processes. And then once those are screened, we'll get into evaluation uh, or milestone three, which comes later uh, this summer. With that said, that's, that's the uh, conclusion of the report. Mr. Rockton. So you, you didn't say this here, but I know it's the case, but when you're done and you've screened it down to, you know, three or four or five, whatever we think are the most feasible or the best of these projects, they'll be, at that point there will be public input. This is what we've done, here's what we're left with, so that that's the opportunity for people who thought one of the ones you dumped was the best thing to have their chance to come and speak and, and speak up. And so we, when we move forward from that point, everybody will have, at least they, we, they may not get their way, but everybody would have had a chance to speak up about the screening that we've done and why we've left, left it with a small number of options that we're really gonna get into. That's correct? That is correct, and, and we are going to be as transparent as possible so people will understand that process and why those decisions were made to screen. Thank you. Mr. Bertrand. So I'm looking at um, some of the considerations to your triple um, evaluation criteria, and one of them is um, supporting the economy. So I was wondering if you'd address two different things that are of concern to me. When I look at the um, fiscal issues, it seems rather high level macro. So if you could talk about how um, staff is going to approach looking at things from a macro level, basically uh, generating jobs? Is it going to have an over spillover effect on improving the general economic activity in Santa Cruz County, which creates tax funds, creates a lot of benefit for the community? The other thing I'd like you to address, because I haven't seen it really, um, maybe it's not you, uh, something identified, which is the micro. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the individual transit customer is this going to make sense to them because ultimately no matter what kind of mode we have what kind of cost structure we have it has to make sense to the individual person the the people who are in cars coming from watsonville or going over the hill or something like that and whatever kind of a situation that is it has to be apparently a, um, beneficial to them so one consideration i'd like in this response is um will offer a solution, and some people may not take it right away because they don't see the immediate benefit, and then they wait until it gets a lot worse. And then they jump in because maybe the economy, the economics for their particular situation has shifted now. So if you could address the macro and how this is gonna be approached, and if you could address the micro in terms of the individual and how they're gonna be looking at this report and seeing the benefit from it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask Pam to help answer your first question on ma macro economics. In terms of the second question, in terms of micro, when we do get to those detailed uh, performance evaluations of whatever comes through screening, we will have some detailed performance evaluations of fares, fare structures, which I think is what you're getting at in terms of that micro. How, what is it gonna cost me as an individual writer to use this system and what benefits do I get out of it in terms of travel time or getting from place to place, that kind of thing. So we will ev evaluate fares and other metrics that will try to get at those types of answers at the micro level. Will it achieve what you're asking in terms of really defining when and how 
the timing of when people decide to choose their mode or shift their mode. We're hoping this you know, ha you know, helps define that. Can't really tell you what the determining point is yet in terms of when people will shift, whether it's fair, travel time savings, a combination of factors. So we're gonna look at a combination of factors to identify what that mode shift would be. And that will be an aggregate, but it will also be individualized if that makes sense. Yes, it does, and I think that's very critical because whatever solution the RTC comes up, it has to make sense to the individual riders right. in this community. Right, and Pam will speak to the macroeconomic question. Thank you. Um, so you'll notice on the matrix, there's a couple of different components. The first component, the upper one, is very much related to cost and O&M and what will it be in terms of actually bringing it to fruition. The second one identifies opportunities for transit-oriented development and also jobs generation. And at the screening level, we will use uh, a, you know data and information that we're able to collect locally, but also across the nation in terms of how these different modes impact those things. And then when we do the, the more detailed screening, we'll get into to the weeds a little bit more. Um, there's a couple of different approaches we can use to actually estimate some of the jobs we think we might be able to generate from these different alternatives, and that will be part of the second phase. Um, was there another related question, or would you like me to expand? No, I, I think you generally re, you know, sort of address what's here. Yeah. Um, if you want to get into a specific thing, is Santa Cruz is, let's say, a unique individual you know this area is unique we're very restricted in terms of many many resources and so if that's going to be a lens you know there's job issues there's the breadth of needing to transport from a to b which are rather extend you know huge extensions from one end to the county and to the other end of the county, stuff like that so if you could address that the lens that you're developing to try to understand Santa Cruz and how this report is going to address the issues from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, when we get into the specific modes, we will be looking very much at the project area. What will be the project area impact? So for example, TOD is a real easy way to discuss this topic. Some of these modes will, will be likely to generate more development than other modes, and that will be very uh, localized. That'll be very much within Santa Cruz, and that will be our, our biggest focus, if that makes sense. TOD transit-oriented yeah, Yes, uh, sorry about that. Yes, transit-oriented oriented development. So development that's occurring along the alignment, near the station stops, that sort of uh, development, very local. <clears throat> Will you be working with uh, associated agencies like AMBAG and others that are working on similar issues? I, you, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we are working with AMBAG and some of their models and tools and as assessments of data where people are coming from and going to. To also answer your question, we are purchasing cell phone data and using that and really understanding travel markets of people in Santa Cruz. And then we will define, uh, you know, we have an anal an analytical tools that can tell us the propensity to shift mode for various different reasons, fair, travel time savings, a variety of things. We'll be looking at all that uh, as part of the detailed analysis as well. So we are coordinating with not only AMBAG and their tools and understanding how that works integrated in the multiple counties, but also with um, uh, the transit ag agency, transportation agency of, of Monterey that's also looking at integrated rail and we're trying to identify ways to connect to their rail system. We're gonna try to connect to Metro's current and potential future bus system as well. So there are a variety of activities that are trying to answer your question that we'll get into in phase two. Okay, one more question, Chair. Sure. As a follow-up, um, I would appreciate some scenarios, some sort of information so I can understand the methods you're using, so I could appreciate and the community could appreciate how the methods you're using will actually get us to the answers that are appropriate to this community. Oh, that is a fair point, and there are some interim products that we're developing. Uh, in my mind, I go by task, you know, very linear, linear in my thinking and how you do these things. In task three, we are going to define that specific approach, including the tools, and then define, identify that travel market so that'll provide some transparency and some input as to what uh, Santa Cruz is looking like based on this data. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, I just have one question to, before to Mr. Schifrin. Um, you, the, uh, the word diesel was mentioned. I, I just can't imagine this county uh, when, uh, accepting anything diesel. Is there any reason to have that in the discussion at all? Uh, we really want to look at the universe. If the universe of alternatives, and in all likelihood, we have had discussions with Caltrans, 
uh, transit operators, everybody's going to uh, zero emission vehicles, including trains. That's where we're headed. We just were looking at the universe here in right. terms of these propulsion systems. In, in, in the end, there was some discussion earlier about uh, autonomous vehicle and technology. That is certainly something we are going to explore too with all of these, uh, all, this whole universe. All right, thank you. Mr. Schifrin, did you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to clarify what we're doing here today. As I understand it, what's being requested is for us to uh, essentially approve milestone one, which is um, the criteria that are on page 2510 11 and 12 for the economy and the equity, et cetera. And those are revised from what was originally uh, proposed based on the staff recommendation, uh, based on the, the public input. Um, and so I think what is useful for us, if, if the commission has changes that we want to see in the criteria, because these are the criteria they're going to be used to evaluate this quote, universe of alternatives, whether we like them or not, um, that will then be narrowed down to a short list of alternatives. Today is the day to sort of give the direction to staff um, to make any changes that we'd like to see in those criteria. So I think it's important that we be specific in terms of, well, if you don't like on page um, 2510, one of the financially feasible uh, criteria like capital cost per rider, what, what do you want them to look at? Because I think, um, as I understand it, we're kind of under the gun from Caltrans to move this process along, to keep it going, and to get to, and we'd like to get to a conclusion within the time period that was set up in the contract. So I think it's important that we act today to um, approve the milestone one and make any changes that we want to, uh, any changes that we want to make to that recommendation that's coming from staff, which is to approve these criteria, to approve uh, the work on the um, alternatives that have been suggested. Am I understanding what's going on today correctly? That's correct, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, and I can uh, write, read the um, staff recommendation. It is those two points. I don't think it's points. necessary since we have it. I just wanted to, since it's possible um, that members of the public are not clear what exactly we're doing here today. I know we got a lot of, the commission got a lot of comments from members of the public, requests for changes. Um, I think some of them were accepted, some of them may not have been accepted, but what we have before us today is a revised list of criteria, and um, what will be useful to us is, at least to me, is to hear whether um, there are specific changes that people think still need to be made that we can ask our staff and uh, consultants to respond to and uh, be able to move this process forward. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, um, thanks, Andy. I appreciate that context as well. The question I have is, I understand at phase one we're at a high level. Um, phase two we become more quantitative. One question I have is, is built into this, I think, that the criteria is, is robust, but whether or not there'll be an analysis to determine or a conversation to determine if a weighting factor on any one of these co categories or any specific item in the category um, will be evaluated at the commission level so that if we decide collectively in, in equity or economy that one of these items is more important than the other, that during that phase two performance measure we have a conversation about how we want to weight those. Is that is that part of this process, or is that going to be discussed later? I, uh, obviously, there is a weighting when you bring this information together. Though the way the project team has talked about uh, presenting the information at the next uh, milestone point, we're um, aiming towards the May seventh RTC meeting, was to bring all of the results of the analysis with the staff recommendation on the short list of alternatives based on all the information that has been brought together. And with that, there, there will be some understanding of what's kind of stands out more than others. Um, but we weren't necessarily going to put a number on each, uh, a weighting factor on each different metric. Certainly not for the next step. But I'm just thinking about um, phase two and then the presentation as, as shown here in kind of October, November timeline. 
when we've gotten down to that distilled smaller list and you guys are analyzing based on these metrics, um, the perspective with which you look at those metrics and the importance of any one of those metrics may inform what that locally preferred alternative is and just ensuring that there's continuity amongst the commission that that, that weighting or that evaluative criteria distills down the locally preferred um, choice. I'm just wondering, I would just wanna make sure that that's part of the process or how that's being looked at. So I would just respond that you're the decision makers, if that's the direction that you wanna give us, that we will certainly take that direction. Um, in the past, when we've done any kind of performance measure analysis, we've discussed this as the project teams. Um, we, and we'll, how we've presented the information is to present it, the results of each of the performance measures for the, whether it's a, a scenario or an alternative that we're evaluating so that each individual commission member can look at that and they can weight it based on their own set of criteria that they feel is important to them. If we wanted to take the time to wait and have the uh, decision by all of the different commissioners, that may make the project go a lot longer and, have a, and get to some agreement on that. Okay, Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Sorry. Uh, one of the items in mention of, let's get down to the specifics of any of the, the language on the tweaking on this. On page 25-11, uh, promotes active transportation. Uh, the comments in the previous section of the RTC notes on 6.4 indicated mobility devices. And that will take into account not only bicycles for mobility, but maybe wheelchairs and et cetera. So maybe language that would broaden the scope in terms of the, um, the ADA component of mobility uh, equipment and the, the cycles. Um, so if we can maybe modify that as a little bit of a tweak of the language for that item, I think it'll be a little bit more broader scope of the equity situation and those that are using the public transit system. Do you mind if I respond to that? So we do in the um, support equity table, there's a um, goal that discusses the active transportation. And so there is a metric there for bicycle capacity on transit every 30 minutes during peak period. Right, but that says bicycle, and what I'm asking for is mobility devices because it would include not only bicycles, but people that are needing those devices to be on the equipment to, to move, such as wheelchairs, walkers, or anything else that would help them with their transit modality um, on any, any kind of equipment that they're gonna be on with wheels to move them. So there is another measure um, under the access evaluation metric that has mobility device capacity on transit every 30 minutes during peak period as well. Be happy to revise that if you feel like that's not inclusive enough of, of what you're thinking about. Um, but so there is two different metrics in, in the different locations, one for bicycle and one for mobility devices. Okay. I that, that's fine, as long as it's clear that it's in there somewhere because I'm, I was going back through the, the um, Elderly and Disability Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, and that's where I was referencing the, the language that was used from that committee to ensure that it's in this as a matrix so that they can see that language is in here for their um, vote or their you know, weight measure. It was a topic that was brought up from various different stakeholders many times. As long as we're clear mm -hmm. that it's in there, that's, that works for okay. me. Thank you. Mr. Bertrand. So my initial questions, um, macro, micro, um, were to support my recommendation that at the early stage right here, even though it's phase one, we call out the issues related to the individual concerns when they're trying to make a decision on what transportation mode they're gonna take. And I think it's important here on the support economy section that there be an option that actually starts the detailing and ensures that this process carries through from phase one to phase two. Is there a certain metric that you're th considering? Yeah, I, I'm Question? focused on basically how, you know, I'm leaving this up to staff how to phrase it because that's not my job. My job here is to try to bring forth a concern. My concern is basically from the standpoint of an individual rider, an individual person that wants to take transportation or switch from cars to transportation. How is this going to become feasible for them? Are we starting at this point early on keeping that into account so that at the end when we're making our evaluation and it comes here, you know, taking into account the option of um, 
doing uh, waiting, you know, how are we gonna view it? You know, maybe someone from one part of this community is gonna wait highly, the fact that it's an affordable mode of transportation. Another person might wait not as much because they like the form of transportation. So I'm not sure how to put this in, but I think at an early on part of this process, we have to identify the individual needs of the, of the people who would be the customers. And I, I think the support economy function, uh, excuse me, uh, portion is an appropriate place to do that. If I could mention, um, there's there's definitely overlap between the various different metrics. So you may look on one table that's the economy metric and may not see what you're looking for, but if you go to equity or some of the other tables, there's a lot of overlap between the metrics that they actually um, support both equity and economy, et cetera. And under the equity table, there is a metric called um, access which is provides accessible and equitable transportation system that is responsive to the needs of all users. And so we do have there, um, the, for the phase one screening, it's a three level, but on the phase two, we have transit fare that's included there, as well as um, independent accessibility for all ages and abilities. Um, transit passenger capacity miles travel, just to make sure the frequency is high enough for people to be able to utilize this. Uh, and then we also have a metric that is uh, discusses um, ridership on the supports environment. Will the project substantially increase transit ridership to commute for commute and recreational trips and for students, residents, and visitors? But I'm not sure that's still getting at what you're looking for. No, I, I like to see something called out specifically. Uh, you're right, these, um, these issues are sort of covered, but they're buried. And so I just want it up front specific so that it's easily seen by the public when they read this report, not reading into the details. So I think it's important to carry that main concern forth. Um, a lot of it's gonna depend on the public perception when the ballot box issue comes up. So maybe if it's more of an attractiveness type of It's not uh, an attractiveness, metric. it's just I want the public to know that we've been thinking about their individual concerns in terms of is this gonna be affordable? Is this gonna affordable. identify my needs as a family, as a single mother, single father, and getting my kids here and there, or me getting to work or something like that? It has to be upfront, otherwise, People are going to, I don't know if they're going to read into the weeds that it was mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. It has to be upfront. So Commissioner Bertrand, you bring up a very good point, and it's something that I've thought about a lot. Um, it's really earlier in the process right now to try to be determining the fare structure, and I think that's what you're kind of getting at is, is you know, what is it going to cost a rider to get on board? So when I'm looking at the support economy section of this, um, this report, uh, we look at both the capital cost and we also look at the O&M cost and then we look at funding. And there's gonna be a, a gap between what the overall capital cost is and what the funding availability is. And that's gonna be how we determine what our fare structure is gonna be. How much are we gonna subsidize the rider or are we gonna subsidize it at all? Um, so I think we could get to the surface of the problem by looking at the delta between those two things, but to actually determine what the fare structure is and how much we wanna subsidize it would be pretty difficult to do at this level of analysis. Um, do you feel that by having the capital cost and O&M cost, and then also looking at the funding availability, that that provides some sort of clarity between what the fare structure might be when comparing alternatives as opposed to actually setting what the fare structure would be at this particular stage. I, I agree with you, uh, Director, that um, it's too early to set the fare structure. I totally agree with you. And I also agree with you that underlying uh, issues are capital maintenance and other things like that, and what kind of support we're gonna get from the county and what kind of support we're gonna get from the state and maybe the federal to do these projects. I totally agree with that. But I want the public to know that early on, the consideration of their individual circumstance is being carried through the process. So yes, you're right, and I totally agree with you. We cannot define it exactly. But if the public knows that early on, explicitly, we're actually trying to think of these issues, and it's, it's transparent to them that we're thinking about it. 
and you're absolutely right that the general, uh, excuse me, the general framework is going to be defined now, and the results of that, depending on our decision, is going to set the concrete basis that we're going to make those decisions. But again, I want it to be come transparently if, um, apparent to the public that we're thinking about it all the way along from the beginning to the end. And if we could do that here, I think that'd be great. Mr. Rotkin. Well, this relates to the question that uh, Director Bertrand just raised, but uh, uh, more broadly, I hope I'm belaboring the obvious, but when you, these are screened and rated A, B, or C, that's not, that's not the end of it. There's going to be a nar narrative description. Why, why is this an A and why is this one a C? And I think it's important that simply that the comments that were just made be taken into account. So the, nar the narrative description of why something was an A was because it's going to be relatively inexpensive or because there's a huge source of funding for this mode that there's not for the others or whatever it is, that that's in effect trying to answer, you know, that this question be taken seriously. I don't know, know that you need to change the text of what's in front of us now, but I do think that's important because when again, when it comes back to us, people need to look at that and say, well, I disagree. I, you said it's an A, but now that you've told me why you picked A, I think you're just completely wrong-headed about that. But there's no way I think ahead of time we can guess what those are going to be or how they're going to work. Yeah, I'll just mention, too, we were talking about this earlier in terms of presentation to you and also to the public. How should we do this? And the way we're envisioning it is that we would have a, actually a narrative cell within the matrix that is explicit about how we got there and that we also provide sources of the information we used in order to inform that, that either relative scoring or, uh, you know, it's just however it is that we do it. So, yes, I can assure you that will be there. Sure. No, so, for example, just take one example of many. If, if you know, you assert that there's a a stream of funding that looks like it's coming online that's going to really make this one much more affordable or uh, uh, support the economy better or support the choice of a person to ride it because the fare won't have to be so high. That, that That's laid out in a way that's sort of clear to people. And again, people might, how do, why do you think it's going to be a bigger source of money? Why do you, where do, why do you think that money's coming down the pike for us to be able to uh, access it? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, again, all you can do at this stage, but I think that's an important way to try and address this question. I also want to read one other point to Andy's point earlier. Um, we're not only looking at these criteria, I mean, I don't know what the other modes might be, but we're saying, in effect, we're closing this off on the ones that are being presented to us here. We're not looking at helium balloons to move people. I mean, so in effect, this is the last, if we vote for this, and I'm prepared to do it, I think it's appropriate and we're ready to go, that this is the universe of possibilities that we think are serious, and we've ruled out the others. And so somebody coming to us five months from now and telling us, you never looked at helium balloons. Well, no, we didn't, because we looked at this, and nobody in the audience got up and said, you didn't look at helium balloons. We, we've given it up, and this is our best guess for the universe. So I'm happy with the universe. I'm happy with the criteria. I think if there's a narration that describes how you select A, B, and C, I think we'll be in good shape. And I'm prepared to move this unless there are other you know, concerns. There are people a couple raise. other comments, but I'll go to you, Mr. Schifrin. We also haven't heard from the public. Yeah, I'll, I know. I'll wait. Mm -hmm. um, I think so far what's driven this effort and the major thing that's been made clear to the commission is this needs to be data driven. We can't make a decision just sort of based on what we'd like to have happen. We really want to have the data to back it up. So what, what I'm hearing from Commissioner Bertrand is that, okay, that may all be fine, but what's the value that's behind it? And what I'm hearing him say, the value is how is this going to serve uh, members of the public? What's, what, what is it in the end, that's what, what do we want in it for them? So what I really hear, what, the way I took what, what he said, was that what's needed in the material that goes out to the public isn't necessarily a change in the criteria how we're approaching it, because that's kind of the best we can do right now, unless we get some uh, feedback from the public that suggests something else, but that there should be some kind of an introduction that's uh, sent out in the narrative that explains why we're doing it, what our values are, and that in the end, the critical value is serving the public, uh, providing a transportation system that's going to be financially feasible, environmentally desirable, um, socially equitable, and is going to provide an alternative to people that they're going to want. So I think just sort of stating what our values are as a way of introducing it 
I hear is that that's really what you're asking for in terms of then, that's the context in which we then will be looking at the data that supports that, supports some outcome over another outcome and lets us achieve those, best achieve those values. So that's, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Commissioner Rotkin that I don't see any more alternatives. I'm interested to hearing if there are any criteria. I think in some ways the changes, some of the changes to the criteria really are in response to the concerns that Commissioner Bertrand raised um, in terms of wanting to have what's the passenger capacity? How will there be room for bicycles? Are we looking at the cost per, per rider? Those are all kinds of uh, criteria that I think in the end will help prov pro provide a picture of um, a, an option that is serving the public best. But I think it does make sense to make clear that that's what we're trying to do, is to serve the public best. Um, one specific question around um, under supports economy funding, um, and maybe that we can agree that this is incorporated into the phrase, how much funding will likely be available? But one question um, that I would like to make sure that we have um, at the forefront are what are the risks to existing funding sources? So that's specifically around some of the proposed legislation that might change the ability to charge fares to certain user groups on our existing transit systems. Mm -hmm. right. So whether or not we want to have that explicitly stated, like the risks to existing funding sources, or we feel comfortable that this phrase incorporates that as well, we just want to make sure, especially as we get to phase two, that we're looking at, you guys are doing a legislative review of what's currently in the known world, which we have a few things out there that are, could be a little bit startling to fair, um, you know, loss of fair revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a, 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 could inform our decision making. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Birch, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, very quickly, um, is it, possible when d discussing the and under the ec economy mm -hmm. um, the fiscally feasible category under the funding uh, subcategory is it possible to discuss when we're discussing the existing funding what that money is currently allocated for in the county ginger or, or <laughs> touch on that Uh, they're part of the task for the um, consultant team is to look at the existing funding sources and the funding plan, um, particularly to go through some of the metro funds that are um, currently in existence. So I think that the questions that you're asking are part of our um, tasks in the scope of work currently, but I'll go check that and make sure. Um, when I, when I think your, um, your request for to add to the metric for the funding sources was transit funding sources, the existing transit funding sources, and that is something that I feel like we already have in our scope. Bertrand. Sorry. It was one, sorry. Um, one thing I've come to learn since I've been on this committee is that every single report that the RTC has done has been, you know, very well researched, but also when the public weighs in, it's been sliced and diced in every single way, you know. And some of the conclusions that people seem to come from that particular report seem to deviate, I think, from what staff totally intended and um, unforeseen. So thanks, Andy, for your comments. Um, I think you helped me focus. When this report is put out and the public is responding, I want it to become patently clear that this committee was focused on the individual and their need to figure out a transportation mode that makes sense to them. Okay, right, I think we'll um, go for the, the public. For Is there any comments from the public? Good morning, Commission. My name is Melani Clark. I am the CEO of Roaring Camp Railroads and the Santa Cruz Big Trees and Pacific Railway. 
As some of you know, we have been running trains in Santa Cruz County since 1963. In 1984, we acquired the Felton branch line, and much like the Santa Cruz branch line, it had been neglected for years to, um, prior to Roaring Camp taking ownership. There were multiple slides and washouts down the canyon, and it took about a year and a half for us to clear the tracks, but by 1986, the Santa Cruz Big Trees was taking passengers to Felton and down to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Our train to the boardwalk has been in operation for 35 years now. Our railroad reaches uh, the beach via a portion of the branch line that goes from Chestnut Street down to the beach boardwalk. And we were able to travel on the branch line via a trackage right agreement that was established with the Southern Pacific back in 1986. I think it's worth mentioning that Assemblyman then, Sam Farr, aided the negotiations and championed travel by rail. We hope the commission knows that the Santa Cruz branch line is a lifeline to uh, the main system for our railroad. For example, we currently have two locomotives waiting in Watsonville for delivery to our railroad, and losing this connection to the system would be a severe loss for us. As the commission meets today to approve the metrics for milestone one on the transit corridor alternative analysis, we wish to bring to attention to the section to the analysis labeled attachment two supports the economy. Under the goals heading in the column results in a well integrated transportation system supporting economic vitality, it currently reads, what is the impact on freight rail operators, shippers and other rail businesses? Roaring Camp would like to request of the Commission that the question in the Transit Corridor Alternative Analysis be amended to specifically name the Santa Cruz Big Trees and Pacific Railway, and that the analysis includes the impact on our railroad. <clears throat> After 57 years of railroad operations in Santa Cruz County, we feel that we've earned the recognition and deserve to not be included in a generic grouping. Thank you for your consideration and, re and support. Good morning, my name is Rosemary Sarka. I am an officer of Roaring Camp Railroads Big Trees. Um, some of you, few of you, know that I have spoken to the commission probably about 12 years now on behalf of rail. I have rarely spoken on behalf of our own railroad, but I would like to address why we would like to specifically be considered under the alternatives analysis. Uh, Roaring Camp, Big Trees' uh, contribution to the community is not only financial in bringing in tourists who spend a lot of money in many other ways, but is also uh, a transportation hub of the approximately 75,000 passengers that uh, Big Trees brings in from Felton. Approximately 20,000 of those uh, have a destination of the boardwalk, thus saving any number of automobile miles. Uh, and the contribution is not only financial, but also cultural. Over the years, Roaring Camp Big Trees has been a specific contributor to what it is to live in Santa Cruz, not only because it is one of our premier tourist attractions, but because of its contribution to the community. Um, Roaring Camp not only donates its property to nonprofits at, for community relations, uh, it also uh, is involved, has worked cooperatively with the Regional Transportation Commission for many, many years now. Uh, we uh, do many uh, community outreach projects, including uh, Senior Night for um, Harbor High and uh, the um, Holiday Lights Train, which is specifically a local rather than tourist event. Uh, so those contributions, uh, among many others, uh, need to be considered as part of your evaluation. Uh, and, and I might conclude in, in mentioning um, if we can get our two locomotives up from Watsonville on a repaired line, we are very interested in presenting a proposal to the commission to uh, manage transportation for the wharf to wharf, which is a very specific example of getting very many cars off Highway 1. Thank you for your attention.
candidate condi uh, commissioners, Manu Koenig, candidate for first district supervisor. Um, I want to thank the consultants for considering such a broad range of options. It was great to see uh, the mini buses, gondolas, etc. There is one glaring hole in the vehicles considered, and that is micro mobility. Uh, what could better meet the goals of efficiency than uh, using the $80 million we have to build the facility uh, in the corridor today? And what could better meet the goals of partnerships than working with entities like Jump and Lime Scooters, which are providing vehicles for free, uh, well, I mean, are providing vehicles for, okay, for a dollar rent, but the government's not buying those vehicles, okay? And so I think I, I want to just point out, I think we have a fundamentally wrong product here that's being, that's being proposed, which is that the government is going to maintain a monopoly on this space, and it's going to provide every vehicle that runs on it. Can you imagine trying to get the cell network we have today if the government had to buy everyone's cell phone? That's ridiculous. So... It, you know, we, yes, we provide computers for people at libraries that, that don't have any other kind of access, and we can look at providing transit for certain people that uh, are low income or have mobility challenges, but we need to allow people to bring their own vehicles to this space and just provide the best possible infrastructure. So that includes public and private vehicles. Um, so, you know, I, I think so many of us are frustrated in the community because, you know, the last step in this process is quantitative analysis. If you really want to get high capacity usage on this, you can't have the government buy everybody's vehicle. You've got to let people bring their own. And so you've got to consider right now using this space for sh uh, shared purpose, both public and private, and consider micromobility. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. Jessica Evans from, uh, representing the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, first, uh, we would just like to thank the RTC staff for an outstanding job of reaching out to the community and to stakeholder groups for feedback on the draft TCAA and, um, and for reading and incorporating a really extraordinarily large volume of public comments. Um, we didn't get every single thing that you know that we asked for, but we see um, that the you know the public's um, wish for you know increased uh, inclusion and especially for increased equity uh, metrics have been addressed and incorporated, and um, we feel like this is a, a much better study than it was before the public comment period, um, and and we're excited to see this study proceeding forward. Um, we do. At, at this last minute, um, I apologize, um, have an additional request regarding the safety evaluation metric under the supports equity section. Um, two metrics that were used in the unified corridor study were total annual collisions and cost associated with collisions in millions per year across all modes. And uh, we would like to request uh, that those two metrics be added to the TCAA in order to give our community a more complete picture of the impact of the different transit modes on safety. Um, and with that, well, thank you once again, and especially um, thank you to the staff for all of your hard work. Uh, Michael Sink, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. I, too, would like to thank uh, everyone involved in this. It was a very good presentation and uh, included a lot of our comments from the public on the review, um, even my grammatical errors in my questions. Um, when we purchased this line years ago, there were basically three kind of reasons we did this. It was a passenger rail service of some capacity, uh, bike and pedestrian trail, and the thing that's not been spoken too much about is the freight and movement of goods was also in that mission by purchasing this. And I think that, if that is still our mission, that's one of my questions, are, are those three items still necessary for this corridor? Um, you look at these modes that are being pre presented on the alternative, there's 18 of them for the corridor. And when you look at the summary, 15 of those 18 are not compatible with freight or movement of goods. Um, so my, 
my question is, the three that are available and left, inner city rail, commuter rail, and light rail, is that really the, the way we're going? I mean, it's nice to throw out all these other 15, but if they don't, aren't compatible with the reason that we purchased this corridor, then I think it's a little bit of a waste of time. I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. And the other question I have, will we share the corridor with freight as Amtrak does now with its passenger service uh, and freight being the priority, basically? Uh, and also, are we obligated to prioritize freight movement versus passenger movement on the corridor? Thank you. Good morning, Mark from C.D. Miller again. Uh, I just wanted to have a, a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, under the economy section, the, uh, both the existing funding and future funding are smeared into a single metric. I think it would be wise for the commission to separate existing funding from potential future funding so that those two items can be looked at separately uh, when you're evaluating options. Um, second of all, uh, I wanted to uh, give a nod here to the Roaring Camps request um, I think Roaring Camp's uh, specific interests in this project should be elevated and treated separately. They are a beloved institution in our community, and the impacts on that institution should be fully recognized and assessed as part of the transit corridor alternative analysis. I also wanted to just uh, second uh, Jessica Evans' request for the inclusion of additional safety requirements. Um, while I was waiting, I, I was looking up uh, the, uh, the old use unified corridor study and uh, the BRT uh, scenario C versus the uh, train scenario B, uh, the rail and trail, uh, according to the UCS, would result in 105 fewer collisions every year at a savings of $26 million every year. Uh, those are not insignificant numbers. And so I think, you know, rail and trail uh, had a clear superiority over the bus and trail option in the UCS, and I think we need to continue to explore that. Uh, public safety is a paramount concern to most people. Um, uh, lastly, um, I was very impressed with staff and consultant uh, work on the public outreach, and um, that was a lot of information. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read every single page of it yet. I will, of course. Um, but I was struck by the, by the response from the public during the workshops. I counted a total of six uh, positive responses to the alternatives options one through five, which are all basically your bus options. Um, and I counted a total of 67 uh, positive responses to options eight through 13, which are the train options, not including the monorail. I thought the monorail just didn't really have much of a chance of uh, making it through the screening process. Um, but with 11 times more people, uh, more yes votes, I guess you would call it, during the public workshops, um, I think you need to you know, be, be conscious of that, and I just want to draw your attention to that. Uh, thank you for your service and your time today. Bye. Hello again, Sandrine Georges. Um, I just want to get back into the fact that um, bicycles are more of a mass transit than people think, because again, today we have electric bicycles that are carrying, there are multi-passenger vehicles. Uh, some of them, as I said earlier, can be enclosed for all weather purposes. Uh, they can carry one, two, three. I mean, there are even um, mini buses that are uh, pedal driven. Um, they have them in the Netherlands. Even in France, we have some and some, um, they carry uh, school kids. They go, uh, they pedal to go to school. It's so much fun. They get a little bit of a workout and uh, studies have shown how it improves their um, uh, time in school. They learn better uh, instead of being driving by car. Uh, even to walk, walk is good though. Um, so I, I think we really need to um, remember that bicycles are vehicles and they can transport more passengers than we think. So every car with one passenger can have two, while bicycles can as well. Three, they can. Four, they can. Five, 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. I think we can safely say at least 10, 12 people um, can be moved by one of those mini buses. Um, so, yeah, because, I mean, we all know all over the world we are really giving bikes more, more space, more everything, because it's the future. We really need to lower our gas emissions, our the pollution is something we can't deal with anymore. Um, you know, I mean, I remember uh, when we used to smoke everywhere, and in France uh, a lot, maybe everywhere. Um, we don't do it anymore. We found ways, um, you know, it was a um, concerted effort, but today this is not happening. It's for the health of everybody. It's for the common good. This is the same. And it's so much cheaper. It's affordable for this county to have this um, um, corridor, this pathway, being um, just allowed to move everybody uh, with a stroller, a bike, a multi-passenger bike. Um, um, as you were saying, ADA people, they can move uh, uh, with their uh, mobility scooters, all of that. Because let's remember one last thing. Uh, rails, they stop and close neighborhoods. It's very important too. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Sarnataro, I attended the Live Oak meeting, and the universe was missing a piece. The universe was missing the piece of an active transportation corridor, which was a, two separated paved roads, uh, one of them for slow and one of them for moderate speed vehicles. Slow being walking, being strollers, moderate speed being uh, vehicles up to 25 miles an hour, uh, mostly bicycles and, and some of the other transportation modes that have been talked about here, some of which are more than one person. I think that it's, it's just, you have a study from the Greenway folks that shows that there actually is potential throughput here that challenges the, uh, the idea that uh, some of the more High, uh, high expense things like rail will actually be more effective for moving uh, people throughout the corridor. And to attend something like that and, be t and see that, well, gee, the, what seems to be something that would make the most sense is not even on there as an option. Um, it just made me feel like there, there's something wrong with the original assumptions that are going behind this. And I, and I think one of the things that kind of the elephant in the room is that you folks are going to ask the community to raise taxes if you're going to put in any kind of a train. And it may be that the amount of taxes that are required to run that train are so much that there's zero chance the community is going to approve them. And why go down that, why go down that road when there are other alternatives that provide greater flexibility? You folks spent a million and a half dollars for a slightly wider lane on the bridge over the San Lorenzo River, <clears throat> instead of spending $500,000 taking out the rails, having a nice wide uh, path where the rails are now, and leaving the pedestrian walkway that was existing in place. And that level of waste and, I would say, irresponsible spending based on some future possibility that has an excellent chance of not actually happening, is is really not in the public interest. And, you know, I'm, I've been coming to the commission now for a couple of years on this issue. I'm sad to see that it is continuing to go down those tracks. Thank you. Good morning. It's morning still. Gina Cole from Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, again, just wanting to reiterate the importance of the capacity numbers for bikes and other mobility devices, wheelchairs, on wh whichever alternative we decide to go with. Um, as a cyclist and also a metro rider, um, 
I have several times been the fourth bike, um, which means that I've got to either huck, huck to another um, metro stop to try and find a bus where I can fit my bike on, um, or I have to wait. Um, and, and the same thing goes for folks in, in wheelchairs. There's two spots on a bus for them. So if we're gonna talk about capacity and we're gonna talk about how many folks that we can serve from Watsonville to Santa Cruz or to Aptos or to wherever their jobs or apartment appointments might be, um, we need to really make sure that the options that we choose are taking everybody's um, last mile, so to speak, everybody's last mile into consideration. Um, there was a really great comment um, in the comment summaries from uh, Nancy Falstich, who is the director at Rehanaracion in, um, in Watsonville, that I'd just like to read. It's really exciting to see all the possibilities of transit on the rail corridor. I support a clean, a quiet, clean rail service. Please center plans on South County residents who currently spend the most time stuck in traffic. Consider prioritizing easy access to Watsonville stations. How about one by Ohlone Parkway? With shuttles, bike rentals, et cetera. Make sure bikes can go on trains. A current problem with bus bike transit is you never know if there'll be a spot for a bike on a bus rack, and buses don't run frequently enough to make it dependable to bike to a bus stop. We need to act fast to reduce emissions. Please choose an option that can be implemented quickly. I'd love to be able to go to the Bay Area and Southern California airport, Southern California and airports easily by public transit from Watsonville. So again, just keeping in mind that South County is indeed a big part of this and that this service will really and truly serve folks like me that commute from Watsonville to this end of the county. Thanks so much. Uh, Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. So first of all, I did attend the, the out meetings and I think you don't look at the, the dots, you look at the elections. You look at the results when you decide on, on that. Um, I wanna reiterate that the mass transit isn't necessarily public transit. Mass transit is not necessarily public transit and we're trending that way in transportation more and more. And for you to restrict this study to public or government funded transit is a huge failure in your, in your uh, criteria. Um, secondly, it, one of the things you're not doing is looking at the, the volume of capacity used for the corridor. It's not about the vehicles, but how often is that corridor used? Is it sitting vacant 98% of the time, or is it used constantly? That's a criteria that's not well outlined in your criteria. Secondly, it's not well defined about the impact on the trail users, uh, each of the users, so that should be additional. Um, and then again, how long will it take to implement the solution needs to be more detailed. Now, I will comment a little bit about freight. I, as most of you know, I've been talking and working with Progressive Rail. Pro Progressive Rail, there is no freight plans north of Buena Vista Road. There's no freight, doesn't exist. Um, to comment on Roaring Camp, they actually ha are a private operator, so they don't meet any uh, FRA requirements that we have to keep them connected to Watsonville. Yeah, they, 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 they wanna get their engines there, but they're a private operator. There's no federal guidelines that requires us to connect that. And to add that criteria, for a, uh, essentially an amusement park ride that we keep this amusement park ride when we're in a transportation crisis. You don't wanna add that criteria. The criteria you do wanna look at is how will it impact their onboarding and offboarding in front of the boardwalk? That's essentially their current outline of their requirements are how, making sure they still have that onboarding access. The connectivity to Watson Mill should not be included. Um, finally, I think it's really, really important to look at, you know, what can we afford? And I think you're doing that. So um, again, we need to use the trail now. Thank you.
Greg Buzzard, again, uh, 30 year resident of the community, unaffiliated with any of the uh, groups. Get the mic to you. Okay, Greg Buzzard, member of the community for the past 30 years, unaffiliated with any of the groups that have been speaking so far. Let me just make the following observation that I think a lot of the rail, uh, bus, mass transit options that are being considered are probably with a, I don't know what the planning cycle is here, but I, can, I have a hard time imagining completion of this in 15, 20 year time frame. And uh, one of the things that really does make sense to me with the at least the trail now argument is to make use of the right of way as soon as possible for many people. And uh, you know, if we come up with something that's economically viable for mass transportation in this county and have justifiable ways uh, of, of achieving that, you know, great. But uh, from my perspective, that seems like we're decades off. And uh, I'd just like to make use of the right of way now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz. Um, I just want to share one of the reasons that I'm a big advocate for the personal rapid transit kind of system. Um, and it's I think it's a missing criteria that could be included in the criteria and be really beneficial for the county. Um, one of the advantages of a personal rapid transit system is that it can have, it could serve directly Cabrillo College, UCSC, downtown Santa Cruz, all part of the existing streamlined system also serving the rail corridor. And I think one of the criteria should be how convenient is service to places like Cabrillo College and Dominican. And um, the system could cover Soquel Avenue, Soquel Drive, all integrated in the same system, providing very quick transportation from anywhere in the system to anywhere in the system. Um, I would love to see a system that extends beyond the railroad tracks and also allows the railroad tracks to be used for whatever they, you know, it could still allow the tracks to be used for freight and the PRT system could be overhead or alongside it. Thank you very much. Okay, any other comments from the public? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. I just want to say that there's been several suggestions. Uh, I think when we, if we consider any of these, we have to probably put it into the formula, will that, how much will that delay or will it delay the implementation or the uh, moving forward with what we have before us today? That's just a concern. We've spent a lot of time on this and uh, um, I think the, the point is we want to keep people moving, but uh, I don't want to delay it any more than we have to, but uh, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Rotkin. Several quick, quick points. Number one, um, the number of people that got up and spoke are suggesting that we not have mass transit on the line. We've made that decision. It was a unanimous decision by this board. I remember when we were talking about buying this right of way, there were people in the audience that said, don't waste the money on buying this. We have no use for it. They came to a lot of our meetings. They were often property owners that live near the track. Thankfully, they've given up. We're going to use this corridor for something, and they don't come to our meetings. I don't think it's anything wrong with people getting up and sharing their views about this issue, but we've moved past the decision about whether we're going to have mass public transit on this line. And it's to say that, well, now we're not considering that, you're absolutely correct. It's not that you're not being heard here. It's that what you're suggesting is something we've already decided, and we want to keep moving forward and not go back and revisit the entire question of whether we even want to look at a mass transit mode on the, on the corridor. And, you know, I know you're not happy with that and you don't feel like we're listening. I think people are listening. It's just at this point that decision's been made. So now we're trying to figure out what's the most appropriate form to move forward with. A couple of points. Um, I think we should add uh, consideration of the big trees uh, railroad consideration to this. I'm not saying that we will necessarily meet what they've asked for. That's part of a process and a study and what it would cost. And as one member from the public said, I, I think the issue of the ability to get to the boardwalk is absolutely critical. It's not quite as important to think about how you get to, not for, of course, for the, uh, I, I, I'm a guest conductor occasionally on the, the upper part of that uh, ride, which is a fantastic experience. But I just want to say, you know, it, it's like I'm not clear um, that if everything else doesn't balance out, that we're that getting two uh, locomotives up to the track is going to be our biggest consideration. But it should be considered. It's one of the factors to look at, and I think that's we should add that to the criteria here. Secondly, uh, that's the second point. Third point. Um, the, um, the safety criteria that were suggested uh, by someone uh, in terms of the collision uh, 
information should also be added as one of the things that we review, and it can be put under one of the existing rubrics there, but it should be added as a specific thing that we're gonna look at. I also thought that the comment that we um, separate out the existing funding from potential future funding as two separate criteria is also worth doing. Again, it's nothing we're not already doing, but just as, as for clarity, that those are not the same thing exactly, and they have different uncertainties about them um, or different kinds of effects. Um, and my final um, issue is the, is the freight question. Um, I guess I'm looking for some comment from staff. I mean, in effect, uh, it, freight is pretty incompatible with most of the modes that we're looking at, and if, in effect, just by making our decision to move with these criteria, we've already ruled out freight north of, of Buena Vista Road. Maybe we should start saying that and stop imagining that there's gonna be, freight's gonna be compatible with these. Or do we want the study to look at freight as one of the impacts, which of these things is most compatible with freight? Um, that's a sort of totally different kind of an, an issue, but I, I'd like some staff comment on that. Um, in any case, so I would add those things I said specifically to a motion or whoever's gonna make it, but I'm not doing it now. I'm gonna I have other comments from other people, but those are the things I think we should take under consideration here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schifrin. Yeah, I wanna follow up and actually ask st staff directly about those potential changes and what effect they'd have on uh, moving the study forward, because I think the chair's concern is a very legitimate one. So in terms of adding specifically on page 25-10, it does talk about freight and other rail businesses uh, are criteria and it sp specifies other rail businesses. Would there be any problem specifically adding Big Trees Roaring Camp Railroad to that criteria? <clears throat> I assumed it would be looked at anyway, but given uh, the request, is there a problem with adding it specifically? I do not see a problem with adding it specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, then in terms of page 25-11, uh, the question about the uh, safety issue, would there be a problem adding criteria, total annual collisions and the cost of collisions? Is that, uh, is there any reason not that, that, that those couldn't be added? That would be part of the performance measure for the phase two, and I do not see that as being a large um, ask. How about uh, separating the existing from future, existing funding from future funding as two separate criteria? Is there any problem with that? I don't see any problem with that. I feel like the um, future sources is going to be speculative, so that's, we um, envision that more of a qualitative discussion about the possibilities of what's gonna happen in the future. It's not gonna be, I can't see that being quantitative. We'll do what we can with the information that we're able to gather. Okay, thank you. And then on page 25-13, under addresses project specific concerns, the integration, given some of the comments about bicycles, does, uh, would it be a problem to add uh, under in, in integration? Does the project integrate into existing multimodal transportation infrastructure? Just adding the word multimodal there, would there be any problem with that? I do not see, think so. Can you tell me what table that's at? That's Is that on the economy? Other goals, page 25-13. Okay. Integration, it's a fourth one down. Could you state it again? It'd just be adding the word multimodal before transportation infrastructure. And the consultant was shaking his head yes, that was okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so um, my sense is, Based on the willingness of staff to add those, I'd make a motion that we approve the staff recommendation with the changes as uh, just uh, agreed to by staff. Um, and that would be my motion. I'll second that and let me. And that's in addition with, with what Mr. Rodkin had mentioned, is that correct? Right? Well, I think I covered all the things that, yeah. that okay. would be mentioned. Okay. Yeah, I just wanna make it clear. Uh, I had one more quick point. Okay, and I have a point too. That you know, um, if we can predict the future funding as well as what the heck they're trying to do in Sacramento to Metro right now, <laughs> my hats off to you because uh, <laughs> if they pass three bills that have been introduced, and you may have read about this in our last Metro meeting, you can say goodbye to Metro, as I stated in that meeting. They wanted free, free, free for everything. Uh, we got to get real in this stuff. Yes. 
also, someone in the audience, uh, Brett, raised the issue about PR, uh, personal rapid transit. I assume when you're looking at this last mile issue, the question of what, how, what happens from the uh, corridor, that the PRT, would that would be one of the considerations of looking at that mode is whether that might be worthy serious consideration that unlike a train on a track, it can get to Cabrillo and so forth. And so I assume that that is part of this analysis here before we screen it down to the, either a train or a bus, but the PRT is still in that mix. Until we look at that question, it may be very attractive. I don't know the answer, uh, what it will find. Is that, can I assume that that's gonna happen in the analysis here? That's correct, and it'll be, those connector services will be looked at detailed phase two. And they, they then impact what the main, the main on the right of way uh, modes are gonna be. That's right. Thank you. Um, the, the question I have, and this is a conversation about the freight situation, and, and what clarity would I find in these the, the matrix here, that uh, with the freight in Watsonville and an alternative other than freight, the impact it's going to have on the South County if that corridor is not going to be available for another resource because freight is the business that we have in that town. Um, I, I don't know how or where I'm seeing in this matrix that kind of question getting flushed out as a priority uh, you know, with the different um, methods of transportation here because the last thing we need is that there is an interest in a bus and then we didn't go back and say, but we have freight in Watsonville and we're never gonna be able to get to the point of using the corridor for our, our personal, you know, the transportation for us to get to the north end until, you know, Aptos, for example. And so I, I just, can you explain to me where or how we're gonna make sure that that kind of question is going to get flushed out in this process? Because the last thing we need is everybody's got this one ideal business model for using this corridor. We have freight in Watsonville, and so that business model won't even exist for Watsonville until we get to a certain end of the county. I, I wanna really make sure that that's part of um, our discussion and an evaluation. And how we can I can provide an answer to that if you'd like. Thank you. So on the supports economy table, there is a evaluation metric called freight and other rail businesses. What is the impact on freight rail operators, shippers, and other rail businesses? It was discussed that there would be called Warren Camp would be called out specifically, but there is that question already there on what is the impact on freight rail operators and shippers. Could well. Uh, it it so doesn't clarify the pedestrian component to this. It, it clarifies, yes, the business for freight, which I think that we've seen statistically that they're looking at a 75% increase over the course of you know the duration of time that we're moving forward on this particular project. The impact that I have is if the modality is different than, than something that goes on the tracks and we have this freight, we may not be able to see anything on the south end for our passengers until a certain point that they're still commuting to get to. So I don't know how to, to formulate that in this when this, this comes to the study and people are changing A to B or C on this because Again, if we're seeing bus on here, then our consumers in Watsonville may not even be able to use this corridor for the purpose of commuting to work until they get past where the freight section would be. If it's segmented where we have freight up to one point and then the modality from that freight forward is you know, not even in Watsonville anymore. I, I just I, So we, we very much see the direction that we're looking at providing transit services is between Pajaro, Watsonville, and down to Santa Cruz with the consideration to all the, go all the way to the west side to Schaefer Road. So if there's an uh, alternative that's going to be evaluated that would need some other type of surface besides tracks that would be compatible with freight in Watsonville, then that service still has to serve the Watsonville community as well as Pajaro to um, connect with the regional rail service at Pajaro. And so if it is a bus rapid transit, then we would have to figure out where the route structure would be, where it would be off of the uh, rail corridor, acquire some other right of way if it needed to be a dedicated facility. So there's certainly the connection to what the Watsonville community is um, fully understood in the analysis that we're going to be doing. And, and that those that are evalu you know, giving their surveys in on this understand that because they, Watsonville's segment on here 
if it's anything other than the rail, it's going to be very difficult for us to see those alternatives for um, this, this particular corridor, because then we're not using the corridor for that purpose. If, if that were to be the case, and then it's, and if not that, then how are we going to show it? How are we going to get that commutability and uh, the folks in Watsonville if there's nothing, um, if, if that alternative is that uh, the freight takes that part of it, we can't widen the corridor for Watsonville. So I don't even know where to go to even look for how that would, how we would factor that through this process when, you know, some of these questions may need a little bit more clarity for the layman that is going to be looking at this and circling A, B, and C. I, maybe it's just the language part of it. I don't know, but um, I, I don't need the impact that we're not very clear that um, it could impact Watsonville um, with some of the alternatives. When we screen down from this initial list of the universe of alternatives, we will then be doing a value engineering study to determine exactly what these different projects will look like. For example, if it's a bus rapid transit, what the system would look like in order to connect the Pajaro Watsonville to, through to um, Santa Cruz. And um, so that, that's very much a part of this study to evaluate all that and, and to bring it to you for the information. Thank you. Maybe just to help clarify, it seems like on some level the question of freight and mass transit is not only included in the freight under economy, but the notion that the transportation corridor um, is continuous, so the next criteria as well. So as you evaluate the universe, big universe and the small universe, that criteria there will look at the spatial distribution of whatever choices we're looking at. And so if we're only taking a portion of freight for a portion of the corridor, that would be a place that we're looking at that piece too. So it's looked at in two different places. Is that a fair way of looking at that criteria? I think you're referring to the one metric that has the freight, and what is the other metric you're referring to? The other to? metric is transportation corridor utilization and preservation, and so it talks about what are the levels of risk that the corridor will not may remain continuous. Mm -hmm. And so on some level, it seems like that will be another that, criteria right. where we evaluate whether or not the services we're providing over this entire network are over the entire network or a, a portion of the services are provided over a portion of the network, and, and you're going to be looking at that freight, public transportation, mm -hmm. mass transit com, uh, conversation at that metric as well. Is that a fair? Correct. Okay. Yep. So I just wanted to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions? I think we have a qu I just want to say thank you. It's just it's been a long haul, so to speak, and I'm glad we have um, <laughs> some, I, it appears, uh, some understanding of just exactly what we're going after and um, with the answers we're going to get in the next uh, phase. So I appreciate uh, all the input that everybody has had in this throughout the process. <clears throat> we do have a motion on the floor uh, to ex accept this with the uh, additional recommendations on the Roaring Camp, uh, the the criteria, separate, um, well, we, you, you've heard it all. So uh, the motion's on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Unanimously, I'll note. Yep. Unanimous support. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Uh, number, item number 26, an addendum to the final environmental impact report for the North Coast Rail Trail Project. Grace Blakesley. Uh -huh. um, good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. Today I'm before you to request your approval of the addendum to the final environmental impact report for the North Coast Rail Trail project as being compliant with CEQA. I'm also before you to request that you authorize the executive director to amend the settlement agreement dated June 7, 2019 to incorporate revisions related to rail crossings to reflect a revised request from the agreement signatories. As background, the North Coast Rail Trail project includes construction of seven and a half miles of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail between Wilder Ranch and Davenport. The multi-use trail on the North Coast could be located on the coast, will be located on the coastal side of the existing railroad tracks, except for a short portion on the southern end where the trail connects to Wilder Ranch. The project also includes parking improvements and trail connections at three locations along the alignment, including Davenport Beach, Bonnie Dune Beach, and Panther Yellow Bank Beach. The RTC has previously approved two environmental impact reports that assess potential environmental impacts to this area. The first was approval of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail 
final environmental impact report that was adopted in 2013 and assess potential environmental impacts report to complete the entire Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail network, including 32 miles of the Coastal Rail Trail and 15 miles of spur trails. The second was RTC's approval of the North Coast Rail Trail Final Environmental Impact Report adopted in March 2019. This evaluated the potential environmental impact of the seven and a half mile North Coast Rail Trail project, potentially feasible mitigation measures that would avoid, minimize, or reduce significant adverse environmental effects and four project alternatives. The final EIR concluded that the proposed project would have no environmental effects that could not be mitigated to levels that are less than significant, with the exception of the cumulative traffic impact. The RTC is now considering changes to its March 2019 approval of the North Coast Rail Trail project, which occurred after certification of the associated final EIR. These changes are primarily being made pursuant to the June 2019 settlement agreement that the RTC entered into with parties engaged in agricultural activities along the trail corridor. Other proposed changes provide clarification and address minor design details that were identified as the design has progressed to 70% and deemed appropriate for inclusion in the addendum. The purpose of the addendum is to address the physical environmental effects associated with minor project clarifications and revisions contained in the settlement agreement. The proposed changes to the project are described in Attachment A, Exhibit A, the addendum, and do not trigger the need for either a subsequent EIR or supplement to the existing final EIR. This is because the changes do not give rise to either a new significant environmental effect or substantial increase in the severity of a previously identified significant effect. Although it's not required to circulate the addendum for public review, it is being provided to the public per this agenda item. The addendum addresses each environmental topic from the final EIR, comparing the effects of the project changes to those found in the final EIR. The addendum establishes that the revisions to the project will not have any new significant effects or cause a significant increase in the severity of the effects beyond those already analyzed in the previously certified final EIR for the project. Mm -hmm. The RTC has also been working in good faith to implement the June 2019 settlement agreement between RTC and parties engaged in farming along the trail corridor in the project area. In December 2019, RTC met with the farmers to discuss the portion of the settlement agreement related to keeping open the rail crossing located at station 350-00 and enclosing, enclosing another private crossing within the project area. In December, the certain parties engaged, the parties signed onto the settlement agreement requested an, that an alternative proposal be considered. The new proposal includes a new crossing being opened approximately 400 feet north of the crossing referenced in the settlement agreement and that the crossing referenced in the settlement agreement be closed instead. RTC proposed this option to the Federal Highway Central Federal Lands Team and they agreed to consider it. The option is now included in the Regional Transportation Commission's application to the California Public Utilities Commission that oversees rail crossings. The changes to the project description and mitigation measures language as agreed upon in the settlement agreement and as it may be further amended and the proposed revisions are described on pages three to six of the addendum. These include, as already mentioned, a new crossing between two existing crossings. This change includes closure of the two existing crossings to the north and the south of the new crossing. It also includes removal of the statement that no gates are proposed as part of the project in the project description for consistency with mitigation measure agricultural-4 and modification of mitigation measure to in, modi excuse me modification of this mitigation measure to indicate that the RTC will install electric or solar gates for the life of the project dependent on consultation with the California Coastal Commission. This also includes modification of general maintenance activities for the trail and the parking lots related to trash and recycling containers to be emptied at least twice a week or more as needed. Damage signs and fencing will be repaired within 30 days. Addressing homeless encampments in the project area, prohibiting pets and horses, and making an effort to limit trespassing onto property, properties by way of trail manager enforcement authority in coordination with county sheriff, state parks, and other law enforcement entities. Signage would also be required to meet at least minimum requirements for consistency with Penal Code Section 6021 and 602.8a. This is related to um, notifying trespassing requirements. 
provided. Um, this also provides that the signage would not, would be designed to minimize visual intrusion and that the content is also developed in collaboration with the California Coastal Commission and egg parties. It also indicates that any signs removed or vandalized would be replaced by the RTC no more than 30 days after the RTC has received notice of removal or vandalism. The addendum also addresses consideration of another type of unobtrusive fencing made of non-corrosive materials as long as the fencing limits trespassing onto contiguous properties and is also consiguous, consistent with the project goals in the final EIR. It also um, indicates that no benches or rest area will be placed at Scaroni Road and that the notice of the trail closure from sunrise to sunset or at least 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. would be put in place to allow for pesticide application and state that the pesticide application would not be limited in any way during the times when the trail is closed provided that egg parties comply with the regulatory requirements relating to the application of pesticides. I do want to note that today's staff is also rec recommending a correction to section page section 4.8 on page 10 of the addendum to remove reference to closing the trail during pesticide applications. The revision to the project description described includes language that states that pesticide application would not be limited in any way during the times when the trail is closed, provided the egg parties comply with the regulatory requirements relating to application of pesticides in the terms of existing future leases. This correction to section 4.8 which compares the effect of the project changes described above to those found in the final EIR related to hazard, provides consistency with the project description and does not change any of the findings. The addendum also revises the project to indicate that farm roads to be replaced as a result of the project would accommodate vehicles of 19 feet wide and the egg parties would be permitted to use farm equipment, including those with metal tracks to cross the rail right of way at CPC, CPUC, California Public Utility Commission approved crossings, provided that the equipment is used and operated in a manner consistent with its manufacturing guides. And our egg parties would not be held liable or responsible for normal wear and tear caused by negligent use, non-negligent use of farm equipment. In addition to the changes to the project description and mitigation measures related um, to the addendum, there's additional minor project design changes included in the addendum. This includes not locating rest areas in agricultural areas, except at Wilder Ranch State Park, and an overall reduction in the rest areas. It also indicates that RTC may not improve rail crossings, crossings in the project area that are remaining open if it is not a new crossing. It also identifies that the toilet at Davenport would be a flush toilet and the bathroom would include a sink with right, within right, RTC right of way. It also includes refinement of the alignment that is nearby the Wilder Cultural Complex to shift the alignment slightly more to the coast on, and on the coastal side of the utility, existing utility poles, which State Parks has indicated a preference for this new alignment. It also in, um, changes the width of the trail to um, change the unpaved shoulder width from six feet to two feet for a total width of 16 feet to provide a consistent trail width along the entire alignment and recognize that horses are not allowed north of Wilder Ranch on the coastal side of Highway 1 as planned for in the Monterey Bay um, Sanctuary Scenic Trail Master Plan. It also realigns the portion of the trail extending through dune habitat near Bonny Dune parking lot so it remains in the rail cut rather than above the rail cut on the coastal side. The current alignment required mitigation measure by 8B, construction of a boardwalk and coastal dune habitat. It was determined that the proposed alignment and boardwalk were not desirable from an engineering standpoint and this also provides the option to, option to potentially consolidate maintenance required due to sand drifts on the trail and rail in this location. It also clarifies discussion about improvements associated with the pedestrian crossing in Davenport and indicate how information signage would direct pedestrians to the crosswalk and clarifies that the project would be er completed as early as 2021 to provide some flexibility to attain additional funding for phase two if needed, um, if, if phase two funding has not been identified at that time. The analysis in the addendum which, is addendum, which is pages six to 12, examine whether or not the changes to the project create any new significant environmental impact compared to the analysis in the final EAR and a brief explanation of the decision not to prepare a subsequent EIR. Pages 13 through 36 of the addendum provide the errata pages that reflect these changes in the addendum. 
So today, staff recommends that the RTC approve the addendum to the final environmental impact report for the North Coast Rail Trail project as being compliant with CEQA, and one correction as mentioned above, and two minor edits. The correction was related to deleting the text closing the trail during pesticide applications in section 4.8 as previously mentioned. Also, the minor edits is to revise the last sentence in section 4.4 to reference the footprint of the realigned Wilder Ranch Trail segment. Right Right now it incorrectly references the Bonnie Dunham Island, which is discussed in preceding paragraphs. And then the last minor edit would be to delete, to be located entirely on fill to minimize impacts on page 14 project characteristics under the trail heading trail proposed project. This is clarified on the same paragraph, but this sentence should be removed for consistency. RTC is also, staff is also recommending um, to that the RTC adopt changes to the mitigation monitoring and reporting program adopted in March 2019 in order to reflect the changes in the mitigation measures set forward in the, demo, in the addendum. To approve a final file and notice of determination with the Santa Cruz County Clerk and Office of Planning Research within five working days of approval of this resolution and authorize the director to amend the settlement agreement dated June 7th, 2019 to incorporate revisions related to trail rail crossings to reflect a revised request, request from the agreement signatories. That concludes my report. Thank you for that full report. Are there any grand new items, Mr. Schifrin? Yes, thank you very much for the report. Um, thank the consultants for their work on the addendum. It should be clear to everybody on the commission just how complicated this yeah. project yeah. really is. Um, it's uh, on the commission-owned right-of-way being funded by a federal agency that's actually the lead agency for the project uh, and is in essentially in charge of the project since they're providing the money. Um, as a federal agency, it will not need a coastal permit, but it will need a consistency determination by the Coastal Commission, um, not to mention the fact that part of the um, right-of-way goes over state parks land, so there needs to be agreements with state parks, as well as approvals from the P Public Utilities Commission. So the fact that this is taking quite a while, oh, I haven't even mentioned the important role that the farmers along the right-of-way have played in terms of their concerns about the impacts that the trail would have on them. So in a sense, the commission is trying to carry out its master plan in a context where we don't have final decision-making authority over parts of it, and we're trying to be good neighbors with our farmers, recognizing that we can't promise things that we can't deliver liver um, because we don't have the ability to. So I think that the, the EIR that was approved by the commission um, would have allowed us to go forward. There were concerns by the adjacent agricultural uh, agriculturalists that led to a settlement agreement, which I think the commission staff in good faith has been trying to implement and led to the need for an addendum which under CEQA does not kick off a whole recirculation requirement, but does allow us to change the, uh, change the EIR as long as there aren't any new significant impacts, and, and I think that's what the, what's before us today. So just wanted to give a little bit of a context before we hear from the public and other commissioners about just what uh, some of the complexities that, uh, that have been involved in doing, doing this project which if, if it continues to move forward could be constructed in 2021 and would be a major increase in the rail trail um, in carrying out the, the master plan. So thank you. Thank you. I just have one question. If, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it said there was a, uh, there's a $4 million uh, shortfall in phase two. Uh, you applied for the funding and it wasn't awarded. And then on 26.3 it says that won't have any fiscal impact on this at this point. Uh, and I want to thank Coastal Conservancy and Land Trust of Santa Cruz County to be involved in this as well. But uh, for that, for, do we reapply for 68 funding? We, we did, didn't reach, uh, meet the criteria or do you just try again or? What's, what do we do with that? We're $4 million short, I guess, but it's not gonna have an impact on this 
specifically, but what what's the future for that? Do we have a, a well, the Proposition 68 funding was one time an op one time opportunity, and they were overwhelmed with the number of competitive projects that applied. So, when we were not um, one of those that has been recommended for award, um, we have been discussing internally um, other grant opportunities for to address that four million dollar shortfall. Um, and we're looking at also, uh, the LPP funds as a possibility, but we haven't gotten too far along in that conversation. Thank you. Could I add yes. uh, something here? You raise a good point. The initial funding was only for phase one, going mm -hmm. from, I think, uh, Wilder Ranch to uh, Laguna <laughs> Creek. Um, since the goal was to go to Davenport, the commission has done the environmental document to go as far as da Davenport. We never had the money um, to go from Laguna Creek to Davenport, but the feeling was um, that if we had the environmental document, if we could get the money, then we could do phase two. So we've been pushing to get the uh, to to be able to get the funding for that, either as part from the agency that's giving the funding for phase one or elsewhere, uh, and hopefully that will be successful in, in the not too distant future. But at this point, all we're really getting the permits for uh, and approvals for, and ultimately the final designs for. Is, phase, is to implement phase mm -hmm. one, or we, are we going to get? The we final actually are. Um, we are actually going to have completed uh, pre-construction activities for both phase one and phase two, and I think it's a theme you've been hearing from the director over your last several meetings and looking at the Highway One projects. It's very important for us to have those activities complete to be competitive for the funding opportunities that come forward at the state. I think we are very well positioned once we have the um, pre-construction activities complete, which we're working very hard towards completing this year to be competitive for other for funding sources for the construction of phase two so that was a very wise decision that the commission made to move forward in, um, in funding the pre-construction activities for both phase one and phase two any other questions any questions from the public move the staff recommendation second oh, sorry, this I think for the public gonna... I was too quick <laughs> yeah. withdraw my motion nice try My name is Marty Demir. I'm a Coast Road resident. Um, live quite nearby the proposed rail trail. Ride my bike on Highway One a lot. The addendum before you does not address the parking needs that will be generated by increased visitation to the Chitoni Coast Dairies National Monument. This trail is funded by a federal lands access program grant. Yet nowhere does the project provide access to federal lands proposed crosswalk in Davenport is badly needed, but only serves to bring visitors into Davenport. There's no access to federal land through Davenport being proposed. Last night, we heard a presentation from the Bureau of Land Management proposing a trailhead and parking at Yellow Bank, the terminus of the funded trail, as I understand it. A pedestrian overpass has been suggested, but it is not discussed in this addendum. Will the second FLAP grant being proposed include funds for a pedestrian overpass across Highway 1. The FEIR proposes that overflow parking can be accommodated by having visitors park on the Highway 1 shoulder. It then acknowledges the dangers to pedestrians who would have to run across the highway. The addendum strikes through the hazards, claiming that visitors will only park on the coast side of the highway. There is no parking along Yellow Bank. This isn't good access planning, given the greatly increased visitation that is expected with the opening of Chotoni Coast Dairies. Finally, revised plans were supposed to be presented at the last bike advisory committee, but were pulled at the last minute. Um, I'm wondering if this addendum includes the changes that were made in those plans since we didn't get to see them. Finally, um, I ask that you hold off on approving this addendum until a more comprehensive regional analysis can be made about the increased visitation that is going to uh, be planned and expected on the North Coast. Thank you. 
Hi, Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. Um, we support this addendum. We support working with the, the farmers. Appreciate RTC staff working with the farmers, Grace. Um, they're a tough crew sometimes. Uh, so uh, we support it, Billy, and uh, so looking forward. The, the question that this raises is, you know, what's the requirements from the C PUC on railroad crossings? So the question will be is, are they going to put new railroad crossings in the middle of the farm? Um, because if you're adding a new uh, railroad crossing, the requirement will be to put in new railroad cross guards. And so those type of um, costs, you know, are not good, you know, hopefully by uh, the time you move forward with implementation, you'll have decided on, well, what are we doing with the, the, the corridor? Are we keeping the tracks or are we not? And so that'll help, that decision can be, you know, understood. But, but I think this really illustrates how you're trying to build this trail and accommodate these tracks to Davenport that are essentially, there's no need for them. And this is what we've been pointing out the entire time, is we're bending over backwards to accommodate these tracks uh, that are not used. Um, so I want us to be sure to understand that. And then the other thing I don't think we're addressing well is the, the expiration or the cancellation of the funds that are available. I don't think it's well understood. We're gonna lose these funds, they, they, they expire. Um, if you don't execute. So one of the things I would, we would suggest in the farmer's support is can we uh, begin the, the trail, and I know this isn't part of the equation here, right? Uh, can we begin at Davenport and come this way because you have a, a cleaner uh, design and uh, knowledge of that. So lastly, I'll just make one more comment about mass transit. It's, we agree, mass transit needs to be on the corridor. Um, that's not the debate. The debate is government-operated transit. And so when we talk about it, when we talk about the difference between mass transit and government transit, it's government-operated. That's the key. Uh, it's not the term mass transit. Mass transit is private-operated, public-operated, all of the blend. When we talk about public transit, that's government operated, and that's the difference. We agree we're gonna do mass transit, but I do appreciate your comment, thank you. Schifrin? Yes, um, I'd make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Um, uh, let me just say, the, there is a national monument in the North Coast. That project is moving forward uh, at some, at the, Bureau of Land Management's pace. It's a totally separate project that's on the other side of the highway. Uh, there has been, as Mr. DeMare said, a proposal to uh, provide an overcrossing. That's, not part, that's never been considered as part of this project. It's not necessary for this project in terms of the rail trail running from Santa Cruz to Davenport. So I think we, uh, it's important to um, move forward with this project to ultimately the PUC is going to have to make the final decision on the railroad crossings and the Coastal Commission is going to make the final decisions on, you know, closures and signage and parking. Uh, I think the Commission has done the best it can to respond to the farmers, to the public, uh, and to the needs to provide a rail and to getting a rail trail up onto the North Coast. and. This is just a step in that process, an important one to move forward. Um, I can't resist saying that there are also private bus companies that are, provide mass transit. So mass transit is not necessarily public, uh, just public. Um, and uh, I also must say that I've, I, I appreciate, again, I appreciate the work that our consultants have done in getting this before us, it was a much more extensive effort than I thought was needed. Um, and as I, re as I read it, it actually reduced environmental impacts um, from what was in the original, uh, what was in the original plan in the original EIR. So I think it's, uh, it's really desirable to move forward at this time. I'll second the motion. Motion, motion by Schiff and seconded by- I, And I appreciate having a chance to second a motion that's supported by Trail Now. 
Right. <laughs> hey, mark that down. Put an asterisk on that one. Uh, I didn't know if there was any other comments from the commission. Don't think so. Uh, we've got a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, oh excuse me. That's <laughs> all right. Aye. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, I, I was just going to say uh, the comment on the crossing and the danger. I know that we took some action and to try to prioritize and address that uh, crossing in Davenport. So I, I, um, I yes, and I that comment was made, and I just wanted to to uh, mention that that it has been addressed and considered uh, a safety, a, a strong, a priority safety concern. So that is being addressed. All right, thank you. thank you. Okay, we have the motion second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. That completes our agenda for today. Our next meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission will be uh, Thursday, April 2nd at 9 o'clock at, uh, at this Board of Supervisors Chamber, 701 Ocean Street. This meeting is adjourned. Hey, you did it on time. Yeah, I got it. I tried to get the phone. Is he busy? Well, I hadn't heard that you